All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is September. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Why did I say September? It is March 22nd, 2023. Oh, man, I've got some great new details that came to be revealed just this afternoon. I, I've been for at least four, four and a half years. I've been I, I've been leery about a place in Scripture. And it's been that long. It's always been in the back of my mind. And it, it just, you know, I, I would I would say, okay, I, it, it's here. It, it's connected to this. But it just, the fact of where it was and the things surrounding it, it just didn't, it just didn't feel right for a long time. But, and, and, and the other piece of it was, you know, if if the church that talks on prophecy who only knows seven years and confuses everything as we know um kept saying that this was the pre it didn't make sense to me because we know how they're confused how they mash everything up when they see seven years and anything that looks like a taking they they think that it means pre-trib we've talked about this many times We'll we'll touch on it just as we talk about in in the playlist, so you guys will get an understanding for anybody that's new. But when I came across this today, I, I had been working on it for a couple days, but <laughs> I was I would say I was being a little bit lazy, but I, I guess I really wasn't. Um, you know, I take my breaks in between, but it's um, it you know a lot of emails and comments and everything that you're dealing with, which is awesome. And we've got our forum for anybody in Ministry Revealed, over 1,100 people. You can come to our website right here, ministryrevealed.com. You can join the forum. There's over 1,100 people worldwide from nations all over the place of diligently seeking brothers and sisters from around the world. And some of them had, uh, I had two or three send me uh, some comments after the last video about the resurrections of the dead. And it was about one particular book in specifically, and it was First Thessalonians chapter four. Now we're going to cover that a little bit as further in as we get going. We're going to share some other things to start, but it, it, it's been understood. We had understood it for a while, but now I'm able to bring clarity to it. All right, you're going to see it for yourselves. But then what happened is. I, I was looking at 1 Thessalonians 5, and 1 Thessalonians is the, is the piece that's been bugging me for a long time. And I started digging into it, and I started digging into it, and, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there was coming. And then it wasn't until just before dinner that I recognized some wording. And I said, hold your horses. Hold on a second. And all of these other pieces that I was connecting to the other parts of Thessalonians 1, uh, 1 Thessalonians, was all lining up to where this connection was. And I thought, could it be? Am I finally understanding it? And I got so excited. I went in, then I had dinner, and I came back, and I was, I was just sitting and relaxing. I'm in my garage as usual. And I was just sitting, and I was just pondering these things. And as I'm pondering, I'm going through my phone on, on, the, on the Bible app, on the eSword Bible app, and I looked at a word that we've talked about many times. We know it's connected to Luke's discourse, and it just never dawned on me to look further in to the details of those words. And when I did, poof, it hit me right between the eyes Brothers and sisters, there are some great revelations here tonight. We're going to build it and build it. You're going to see these connections, this day of the Lord, all this stuff connected to the day of the Lord, that, that final when he comes feet down on the Mount of Olives, it's going to blow you away. We're gonna, I'm going to share a little bit near the beginning too about um, um, the, the, the sea and why the sea is gone, you know. Uh, Mike from 165 called the other day and shared with me quickly from uh, Revelation 21, you know, why is there no more C? And so I wanted to go in and see what else I could show to show that this connection of C 
is relating to people and that it's most likely because of this group of people that is no longer in this area, but is now um, is now in the new heaven and in the new earth and so forth. We'll t we'll touch on that as well. But guys, it's so exciting. And, you know, this was like, uh, what, it's eight o'clock. This is like 20 minutes ago uh, that that final piece just kind of popped in and and came about. So it's very, very, very exciting. And, you know, as we get going, the first thing I'm going to start with is this right here. This is from um, our sister. So we have two two of our sisters here in the ministry. This is Trisha, uh, Trisha and Karina. So Trisha just just I don't know when it was. It was just maybe a, a, just a few months ago. And she she was planning on doing work. She was planning on getting things done. Something got canceled. And so she was hanging out for the day. And she she's she's got a really strong relationship with the Lord. And she knew something was coming about and she went and sat down at her computer and bam she writes her first um non-fiction uh, uh her first fiction not uh, a book she had never writ written fiction before in fact if you click on right here this is on uh, amazon of course these are her books like she's a serious writer just like uh our sister petra from south africa uh she has uh the the spirit of wisdom and revelation youtube channel so this is trisha and this is the the newest book that just came out and it's her first fiction one and what's exciting is our other sister karina she i think she's from spain actually she's an artist she's the illustrator and it's absolutely beautiful you guys should come check it out you can buy one uh, depending where you live on Amazon. And uh, the reason I say depending is the next part I'm going to share with you guys as well that we're doing. Um, and I say that's why I say depending because where you are in the world, you may not be able to get books from Amazon. But this is a great one. So it's a, it's a fanciful story of false, identi of false identities we accumulate trying to answer our deepest questions. And this is where the wording, you're going to see, this is the kind of wording that the book has. Wheelers that wheel, holders that hold, catchers that catch, and a gazing glass that grabs glimpses of gazes from gazers who gaze. <laughs> Come meet a dresser named Daisy and experience her most miraculous miracle. Her miracle could be yours too. All right, so it's a great little book. I really wanted to share it. Come and check it out and know that the illustrations, I mean, they're just incredible. Our sister Karina had actually, uh, she's been in competition. She's posted uh, in the forum. We all went and a bunch of us there voted for. Uh, it, it's just awesome. So they did a, a fantastic job and I really wanted to share that with you guys. The other part I wanna share with you is in relation to our book, Ministry Reveal. Of course, you can go to ministryreveal.com. You don't have to buy the paperback, all right? I know how it gets in Christian communities and, oh, they're trying to make money. No. I don't give a rip if you buy the paperback. I do not care except for you to have the revelations that are in it. But you don't have to pay for it. You can go to ministryrevealed.com and you could read it right from the book page on the website. All 200 and some odd pages are on the website on the book page in English. You can download it in free PDF to your computer and read it. And it's got five different languages for free. Um, you can get the paperback. I believe it's in two languages. It's in English and I believe it's in Norwegian. You can listen to it in an auto in the audible uh, audio on the website as well, or you can get the Kindle here. So, but the reason I'm bringing this up is we have, as you guys know, our brother Steve, a ministry, uh, an incredibly hardworking ministry over in Uganda. They share the gospel, they feed the poor, they clothe the, the needy. Um, they, they just do a wonderful job. He, he teaches pastors, he goes into churches, he, 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 all sorts of things going on over there. And it's a wonderful thing. And we've been supporting, and many of the people in the ministry support directly. And we just gave, uh, there was a, a nice uh, donation that came in uh, earlier today that I already sent to him that was already allocated for... Um, 50 Bibles and I believe uh, children's material to go to this other group of churches that he's going to. 
But one of the reasons I'm bringing, or the main reason I'm bringing this up though, is we want to raise some more funds for them because like I said, the books from Amazon can't get everywhere. And one of the places you can't get them to is, is um, in Uganda. It's extremely difficult to mostly not even feasible. We've tried, and how this came about was our sister, I believe she's over in Europe, in the UK or something like that. And uh, she had asked, uh, her name is Ziv, and she had asked if we can get him some books, and she was trying to get him some books. Uh, they wanted to send 50 books over there to give to 50 church leaders that he goes to and let them read through it and begin to understand these revelations. But we had been going back and forth and digging and searching and, and Google searches and everything on how to get the books there, especially if this time that we're in is as limited as we believe. There's not weeks to, to get it shipped over there, right? To have it come in, package it, and to ship it out. So um, they had a conversation, her and Steve, and they, they found a printer. He's got a printer where he lives. He has a printer as well. But to do this big job, I mean, each book is 280 something pages. So to print that out is going to be a lot of work. So he's got a, a printer company there that he struck a deal with and they want to get 50 of these printed. And to get all 50 printed is about, what, what did I write down here? Uh, it's around $1,200 Canadian. Yeah, there it is. It's around $1,200 Canadian. So about $22 Canadian per book. So not too bad considering it's all printed out. So I would assume they're gonna do front back of pages. Otherwise, that's gonna be a whole ton of paper. But um, that's, that's what the ask is here. For anybody who can, you can support us here in this mission at uh, GoFundMe or at PayPal. And the links are right here or they're in the description box under the video or on the Ministry Revealed website. And we're gonna get that support over to them to get these printed right away so that they can get these into the churches within the next week or so. That's how quickly uh, this can get done. All right, so those are two great things I wanted to share with you, and uh, it'll be a great blessing for them, guys. Just think, we're gonna reach people in Uganda with the revelation that these pastors will begin to understand and start teaching in their churches. How awesome is that? All right, so I really wanted to share that with you. The next thing I wanna share with you is this i thought this was pretty awesome now i say awesome i mean <laughs> it's not awesome in the sense of oh this is so great you know i can't wait for this to happen but awesome or i should say exciting in the sense that we're seeing this being talked about now because the timing of this is absolutely perfect here's what i'm talking about will new israel bill outlaw the gospel. You see, there's a whole bunch of talk just over the last few days, right? Three days, 10 hours, 17 hours. Netanyahu, Israel won't pass anti-Christian law, but they don't know yet, right? It's, it's a bill being proposed to ban the gospel of Jesus Christ in Israel. You see, Netanyahu had to side with a whole bunch of, with, with, with the, the whole super right wing in Israel, in the government. That's who he had to form his coalition with. So if he wants to get other things done, he's got to do some things that these guys wanted, okay? So it's not a done deal that they're going to pass it. But what I'm about to share with you is probable that this would pass. I don't mean today or tomorrow, but it would appear to be very, very soon. And even if this bill isn't quote unquote accepted to pass, you're gonna see that the implementation of this type of thing is about to take place anyways. This is exactly what we know from scripture. It's all part of the beginning of the, 40, the, 50, the 50 days that comes before the 14 years of tribulation begin. And for anybody that's new and you're hearing this and you're saying 14 years, what's this guy talking about? Don't worry, you'll come to understand it soon. All right, I'm going to share with you some places to go and understand it. And you're going to see why you never understood the first seven years. All right, it's in an intro series. But you see, here's uh, Stephen Bendenoon talking about it. And Stephen Bendenoon, look at this clip right here. So 
the exclusive uh, two Knesset members propose legislation to outlaw sharing the gospel in Israel. And listen to this, send violators to prison. Could it become law? Well, you want me to show you something? Let me close these tabs. I've got so many tabs open for you guys tonight. Check this out. What do we know? Here in Ministry Revealed, we know who the Gospels are speaking to, and we know that the discourses are three different periods of time. All right? We know that Luke's discourse is a 40, 50 day portion of time before the tribulation of seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets begins, okay? Mark's discourse is the seven years of seals. Matthew's discourse is the seven years of trumpets. And when you see what's coming later in relation to the wording in the discourses and, and that revelation that came from it in two parts, it's awesome, okay? But remember, during this first 50, 40 days, in particular the 40 days that comes before the 14 year starts, it's in the 50 days, okay? We know that what's gonna happen. Well, listen to this. In Luke 21, verse 10, it says, then said he unto them. So when you go to Mark's discourse in Matthew's, you don't have any black letter words, then he said he unto them. It's as if the conversation is he saying, see, Mark, this is to Mark in Matthew. Then he said unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, right? Great earthquakes, great signs, and so forth. This he's saying is going to begin for these guys. When you go to Mark's discourse, it just straight out says it will be nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, right? Uh, famines and, and uh, right? The roiling of water, the troubles, right? And these are the beginnings of tribulation. Luke's does not say that. Luke's is completely different than Mark and Matthew's because it represents this period of time, this short period of time before the 14 years begin. And that's why in verse 12, he jumps in and says, but before all these, what? But before all of these, he's telling you, before the red horse rider, when the 14 years begins at the attack on Jerusalem, which will begin World War III, but before all these, listen to this. They shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and unto prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. What did we just show? That they're suddenly at this time trying to pass a law to ban preaching of Christians, or they will imprison them now now this is happening this is why i say it's exciting it's exciting because it's another thing pointing to this season and time that we are believed to be in right now listen to this let me just briefly lay it out for you for those that are new <clears throat> or for those who hadn't fully seen i'm not going to go into every detail except to tell you that following the hebrew calendar which i do believe is on track this year that this year the 50 days will begin on resurrection day on the 16th of nisan april 7th so depending where you are in the world. And that at this point is the escape of the bride of Christ. We, this is five and a half years of revelation. This isn't just picking this date because it's resurrection day. It's the entire storyline. It's the storyline of Taurus. It's the storyline of in the beginning of creation. It's the storyline of Taurus and Christ who was in the beginning when it was Taurus, and now there's a separation between uh, of 50 days between them. We know that the Lord God is counting from the Feast of Weeks. That is the beginning to the Lord God. In Taurus, which is Savan, this is the end of the 50 days and the beginning of the 14 years. So the 50 days that come before the 14 years begin on the 16th of Nisan, April 7th, 
2023 and will end the 50th day on, what is that, May 26th, the 6th of Savan, Shavuot, 2023. And Jerusalem will then be attacked and the Jews will be scattered and the first seven years of seals, which is to the world, the church, will take place. This is the beginning of it all. And it's precisely 50 days between it, which is exactly the revelation we've been given here for over four years that we've been breaking down and giving greater and greater detail to. So here we are now. And this started just earlier this week where the Jews are bringing up a policy, a bill to implement to stop Christians from preaching or get prison time. And here we are saying, here's the escape. The wedding will take place in heaven. The Lord returns on the eighth day to begin his 40 days, which is to warn as he said he would, as Jonah did in Luke 11 for 40 days. This is, this is when that portion begins. And it goes to, I think it's around right here. Then the Son of Man leaves, and the anointing of the Holy Ghost comes not many days later, fifty day, three days later, on the 50th day. They'll receive the anointing from the Holy Ghost, the, the workers of seals, the, the, the Smyrna church workers, the Luke seals workers. They were with the Lord for 40 days. They'll receive the anointing on the 50th, and they'll go out from Jerusalem doing their work as servants for the Lord and Jerusalem will be attacked. And they just started talking about putting Christians in prison in Israel. My goodness, add this to everything else we've been talking about and sharing. And man, everything is primed, brothers and sisters. Everything is primed. It's so exciting. I had to share that with you. You see, now, now you see the, 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 the dilemma in the, in the thought, right? Because it's exciting. Why? Because it's more evidence to the season and time that's at hand. It's more evidence. We know it's the end of true 70 years in Taurus. And that it's 50 days that comes first. So it's the excitement and the joy of the pre-trib escape to be with the Lord to be at the wedding, to, to sit in the lowest room, not going up to the highest, but sitting in the lowest room. And if he calls, then we get brought up to a higher place. But our joy is just being there, right? But what else does it mean? It means tribulations coming. It means a period of time like no other in human history. Within it, great joy, and within it, excruciating pain and sorrow but all for the Lord God's purpose and will to wake up those who are remaining, who are still to come in. Those who weren't watching, those who weren't praying, those who weren't seeking, those who weren't repentant. Be ready, brothers and sisters, watching and praying, repentant and diligent always. I believe our time is at hand. So awesome. Now check this out. I wanted to start with this because I really wanted to make a, a straightforward point about this. Okay, if we go into Revelation chapter 20, because when the questions were coming in uh, from a few people, I was saying two or three, I think it was three that I saw, all right, in, in the comments and questions and emails that were coming to me. You see, a lot of people still say, but I... Uh... I still think there, the, the, there's a dead in Christ that are going first, okay? And in the last video, I was showing no. There, there's no resurrection of the dead until the end. And how do you know it? Well, it, it's right here in Revelation chapter 20, okay? Those that, receive, those that refuse to receive the mark, right? They, they died, right? They were beheaded for it. And it says what? And it says, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not until the thousand years were over. Listen to what this says. It doesn't get any more clear than this. 
There it is right there. This is the first resurrection. It's almost like you can just close it and say, okay, that's it. <laughs> you know, the Bible told us this is the first resurrection. All right? I'm serious. I'm saying it jokingly, but I mean, just close it. We're done. The video's over. Right? There is no pre trib, mid trib resurrection of the dead. And what's happened, though, is so many people got confused by it because we've been taught seven years. We've been taught everything from a foundation of Matthew. We never knew who the Gospels were speaking to. And so it still causes some people, um, especially those newer, but in particular, even those that have been around in the ministry for a little bit, to still have some of those old ways still hanging around because they maybe don't yet have clarity in a particular piece of scripture. All right. And that's what I'm going to share tonight. I'm going to open up these scriptures so that everybody could see that it's the day of the Lord that this happens. All right. That it's when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. You guys will see that this is when this takes place. OK. So that's what we're going to get going into. We're going to we're going to break all this down. But right before we get into all that, as I said, for anybody that's new, you're going to hear things 14 years, as you've heard. You're going to hear things like who the Gospels are speaking to. This is all comes to begin to be revealed for you right here. The Revealed End Time Study Notes series. Click on this playlist. And you're going to want to watch these first three videos. These are going to begin to open up your mind to the revelation of the truth of the revelation of the end of days all right this one here it's a 30-minute bible study which is in chapter one of the book goes into further detail and even from the book we've got way more that we have shown from from even beyond what the book has this is a 30-minute bible study i read from a thing i typed out from the the document i typed out which you can get in the description box under the video or from ministryrevealed.com you're going to begin to understand for the first time these things that people called discrepancies within the Gospels. The reason why Muslims will say, oh, look at these discrepancies. See, it was written by man. Why, why people that were atheists or that would look at scriptures and then say, no, nope, it was written by men. Look at all these things that Luke, Mark, and Matthew say in the Synoptic Gospels. There's contradictions all over the place. This video is going to show you that it's three different groups of people that the Lord is speaking to. Remember, you've heard the, the words, the first will be last and the last will be first. Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the end of days is Luke, Mark, and Matthew. Luke is the bride of Christ and the remnant bride workers that remain with him for 40 days and then will work during seals and maybe a little bit further. A little bit more clarity is coming on that. Mark is speaking to the world, the house of Israel, the Gentiles that are grafted in, uh, the church that's still asleep. They're, they're not diligent in the Lord. They're not seeking him. They just, they claim Christ, but they just live their life and do whatever. And they're not repentant. They're not praying daily and so forth. All right. And Matthew is written to the house of Judah, to the Jews. Okay. Luke in, in Christ going to the cross, he was arrayed in a gorgeous robe, which means white, radiant, beautiful. In Mark, he was arrayed in purple. In Matthew, he was arrayed in scarlet. They weren't colorblind. Is that a discrepancy? That's definitely a discrepancy. And we've got hundreds upon hundreds that we have shown, or I should say dozens upon dozens that we have shown and proven what these differences mean. And what it, the answer is, is it was prophecy of the is to come littered throughout the gospels and it was never understood that's what you're going to understand you can even watch it as you begin to understand these things you're going to realize that wait a second well if they're speaking to different groups of people well then if we've all been taught everything from matthew and matthew's discourse is the seven years you're going to say well wait a second then what's mark's discourse you got it. Mark's discourse is the seven years of 
seals. This is going to blow your mind. This is a 30 minute intro Bible study as well. Chapter two of the book goes into greater detail and we have even beyond greater detail since then as well. Then you're gonna wanna watch this big video. It's all because of Matthew, two hours and 43 minutes long. I'm telling you, it's going to blow your mind as you begin to understand these two. And the title is perfect. It's all because of Matthew. Because everybody for hundreds of years through the churches, seminaries, pastors, they've all been looking at everything through the lens of the eyes of Matthew. And so anything, when they go into the rest of the, of the New Testament and anything that looks like it's, like it's a, a taking, a, anything, they think it's pre-trib if they're pre-tribbers. Others will say, no, well, that means mid-trib. And others will say, no, it means post-trib. All of this comes because we've all been taught from a foundation in the Gospel of Matthew. So our eyes are focused from the viewpoint of Judah, which is why the church says, see, that's the seven years of tribulation to the Jews. That's why we're gone first and everybody goes pre-trib that calls Christ, that calls on Christ as Lord and Savior. What you're going to realize is that's at the end of the seven years in the seventh year of seals. That's why the great multitude rapture in Revelation 7 is between the sixth and the seventh seal. You see, it's going to blow your mind and you're going to understand that it wasn't necessarily the pastor's fault. You know, maybe church, the ancient church through Rome hid some of these things, but it's overall not because it's the church's fault or the seminaries. It just wasn't yet revealed. And you begin to understand the reason it wasn't revealed is because if they knew these things ahead of time, the whole world would have been taught from the gospel of Matthew and the Lord God's plan of salvation, the Lord God's plan of redemption for everything is the harvesting of a field, the first fruits, 10%, the, 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 the main harvest, right? Which is the great multitude. And then the corners and gleaning, which is when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. And all of this is going to show you that pre, mid, and post, they are all true. It is Luke, Mark, and Matthew. And from there, as you begin to get really good at it and being able to see and discern these things, you can come down to the 11th video and see the discourses revealed. It is going to blow your mind. It's so exciting. It's so beautiful. It will be worth every moment of your time. I promise you. All right. So again, you can get the book. You can, you can go download it for free. But also, if you can, help support the ministry so we can get these printed and Uganda can begin to receive these understandings as well. All right. So let's carry on from there. Watch this. Watch this. See, now what I want to share with you guys, this won't take very long. I just wanted to add some of this for you guys. You see, in the last video, we were talking about something really interesting. And I'm not saying it's the whole answer yet, but it seems to be part of the answer because we were talking about here um, at the end, right? So what do we see at the end? That the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You see, the second death, this comes at the end of the millennial reign, when everything comes to an end. But what we don't see cast into the lake of fire is the sea. You see, in the last video, we were talking about death and hell. You know, they're going to be judged and they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. But those that are in the sea or whatever the relation is to what the sea represents isn't. So why isn't the sea? Why wasn't the sea also cast into the lake of fire? Well, sea also means, right, it relates to a Greek word, which is salt, which is 251, and it's used one time, okay? We're go well, I'm going to show you that in a moment. When we go to Revelation 21, this is what Mike was sharing. You see, in Revelation 21, when the millennial reign is over, and it says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, 
and there was no more sea. It was like Mike said, you know, <clears throat> was God upset with the sea? No, when God created the sea, I think it was the third day, he said it was perfect, right? Or he said it was good. So it, it can't be a, a direct relation to the sea. It sounds like it's a relation to people that were represented, you know, like the sea of humanity, but from a group of people who are not in hell with death. And when I shared on this in the last one, I was showing this connection like where Abraham is, where Lazarus who went into his bosom and the other guy, the rich guy who was in hell and was asking Abraham to have Lazarus dip his finger in water and put it on his lips, which means they're in an area of water. And of course, the chasm away <coughs> is where hell is. So this, this sea is a relation to people and <clears throat> the sea is what? Salty, right? The sea is salt. Well, when we go into Mark, in Mark 9, verse 49, we see this conversation of salt where it's only used one time. And listen to what it says. Let's go to Mark 9, 49. Okay, 49 and 50. It says, for everyone shall be salted with fire and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. It's kind of interesting, right? What do we know about Mark's group? Everyone shall be salted with fire, right? So tribulation, right? The fire and every sacrifice. So it's like you have those that lived and those that died when it comes time to for the rapture, right? We know there are those that have palms in their hands who have gone through the fire, and we know there are those who were sacrificed and killed, <coughs> right? And it says salt is good. Where does salt come from? It's connected to the sea. So the good and those who would have good works probably connected to the sea and those who have salt. But if the salt have lost his saltiness, See, his saltiness, wherewith will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. That's, that's a pretty straightforward word right there in relation to those connected to salt in the sea. Let's go to, let's go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. And see what else it has to say about salt. Right at the end again, if I remember. No. I think, what did it say, 13? Oops, one sec. What did it say? Oh, Matthew 5. Wrong place. All right. Matthew 5, verse 13. Okay. You are the salt of the earth. And if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is hence good for nothing but to cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Hello. You see, this is all in relation to people. And salt is, of course, the one connected <coughs> to people. So even here, this is in uh, Luke chapter 14. So if we go to Luke chapter 14, we know this quite well in Luke chapter 14, don't we? We can see these different groups that he's speaking to. Remember, this is what I was just talking about. This is the wedding feast. This is the wedding that's going to take place for seven days at the escape of the bride of Christ on day one of 50. The wedding's going to last seven days. <coughs> Excuse me. When the wedding is over and the Lord returns on the eighth day, he's going to come and have a meal with those who are his workers. He's going to sit and serve them and eat with them. And who are these people? These are they who are going to have 
part of the resurrection of the just. This is, this is the group of workers. Some of them are going to die and some of them won't, right? So they have to be resurrected at the end because this is his SEALs worker group. They have a special anointing and a special place in Christ. Okay? Everybody that goes pre-trib is in Christ, spirit-filled. And the remnant bride that remains is also in Christ, spirit-filled. Okay? This is the Luke 24 group of workers that he's going to have his meal with. We're going to share in a little bit to show these incredible connections later from Luke chapter 12 again, of which this is the group from Luke chapter 12 when he said when he returns from the wedding that he would come and sit and eat with them and serve them. That's why Luke is the only one that has this great banquet after the wedding feast. And when you go to Mark, there's no banquet, no wedding feast. When you go to Matthew, there's no banquet, only the wedding feast, because that's the second wedding. He has his Gentile bride, and then he has his, his Jewish bride, right? He, there's two. So as we go down and we see this, we know this is a connection to the time of when the Lord's coming. And here he is. At the time when he comes to start his 40 days, he has his meal with the disciples. And look at the conversation with them. See, happily after he hath laid the foundation. Well, the laying of the foundation is happening during seals. It's the apostles who are the ones responsible in the laying of the foundation. They're going to be the, the modern day apostles that will be anointed by him breathing on at the beginning of the 50 days when the pre-trib happens. They're going to be the ones during that first week doing whatever it is their job is as apostles but they're also going to be remaining at least during seals as well. When it comes to this period of seals, the disciples will also be there with them. And this conversation here is the cost of discipleship. This is the beginning. This is the Lord coming for 40 days. <laughs> okay, he's letting them know this, this laying of the foundation that's going to take place. There's going to be the spiritual foundation taking place during seals. And as we know, there's going to be a physical foundation being laid in Jerusalem while they've been removed. A group are going to be brought back and a actual physical foundation is going to be laid as well. But that's the only thing that's going to happen in Jerusalem being laid during the time of seals. OK, so this is all this cost and conversation about being a disciple for the Lord, guys. This is the stuff. Get ready in this stuff, right? So it says. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Are you ready for this? We here in this ministry as 14ers and everything that's been revealed, I believe many of us are being prepared. Okay, like the original Smyrna, 14ers. Willing to give up everything to follow him. And look at the story that follows next. Salt is good. But if the salt have lost his, flavor, his savor, wherewith shall, he be, shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath, an e he that hath ears, let him hear. Okay? All throughout this, we can see this connection to the, the sea and those who are salted is this salt of the sea, if you will. Okay. When we come into Revelation chapter 17, in verse 15, we see, And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples, nation, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Okay. So the waters again being referred to as people. So when we're seeing this as this sea, and the sea isn't being cast into hell. And that this sea at the very end, like John chapter 21, the 153 fish. Yes, there's going to probably be more to come on that. But this connection is this, is this final scoop, is this final group from the sea being brought, excuse me, being brought into the nets. That's why, of course, it's in John chapter 21. For anybody that's new, we're talking about this. There are books in the Bible that have revealed themselves 
that we call chapters to years. In each chapter, there's info, sometimes the entire chapter, sometimes parts of it, that are directly related to end time events. They are all prophetic throughout all of these books. And John's Gospel is one that has 21 chapters that is a typology built within it that stands on its own that gives insight all the way through to the end of days. And when it's all over, look at that, chapter 21 in the 14th year of tribulation, there were seven easy years, the 50 days that comes right before it ends, and the 14 years that begins is like chapter 21. And when it's over, bam, the 153 fish, that final catch in the net. All right. So we definitely have these pictures everywhere. And so the fact that there's no more sea, I believe, is because it's, it's over. Right now, the millennial reign is over. There's no more sea. There's no more holding place where these people of their good works are being judged from. They've now been taken out and the final judgment and all of that has taken place. You see, that's why you had Abraham there and all these different people. Right. And and waters and salt related to all the people. So I wanted to add that into the mix because it's very interesting. Not only is it not cast into the lake of fire where the other two are, but you see that there's no more sea at the millennial reign on the last day. All right. Very interesting, very fun stuff. Okay. Yeah, you also have this, right? Fishers of men. He's going to teach you. He's going to teach them to be what? Fishers of men. Where are, you, where are they catching the fish from? From the grocery store? <laughs> of course not, right? Catching them from the sea. So you see it all throughout Scripture, right? All throughout the New Testament. They're catching them from the sea. So now let's keep going in this. And we can see this right here, okay? The focus as we, as we get going a little bit further, we're almost there, is going to then be in Thessalonians. And this entire conversation in Thessalonians 1 and in Thessalonians 2, for that matter, you're going to see where this conversation is. But I also want to lay this out to you guys so you could see exactly in relation to this word at his coming is all about the end of seals, uh, sorry, is all about the end of trumpets in that final 14th year of trumpets. The entire story points us to there, which is the day of the Lord. And as it builds, you're going to see these incredible connections just proving it all out that this confusion that we've been taught all of these years, you know, some put the day of the Lord at the beginning. You know, you're going to see even this connection to uh, Joel chapter 3. You know, we revealed even the book of Joel in order. So you've got chapter 1, 2, 3, which is like a pre-mid post. It's absolutely incredible. Wait, man, I'm so excited to get there because when you see these things and, and what we thought was connected to somewhere else, when you see where it's actually connected, you're going to say, oh my goodness. And the reason I'm so excited about it is, as I told you guys before, it, it frustrated me for a long time. It's been in the back of my mind for so long. And, you know, I'm in prayer every night with the Lord. And I just, you know, Lord, your will, what do you want to show me next? What incredible mystery can we add to the revelation and continue to draw brothers and sisters in to diligently seek these things for themselves to see that they be true? Okay, to be Bereans. It's awesome. It's so exciting. You know, one of the specific ones that happened was the one we were just talking about here, you know, this whole 50 days, right? When, when that one happened about a week, I guess a couple of weeks ago or so now, I remember saying, Lord, what would you like to share with me next? Something exciting, something I know everything has been exciting in the revelation, but show me something <coughs> so exciting that will just blow our minds. And do you remember what it was? knowing that the Lord is counting, the Father God is counting from Taurus Feast of Weeks. The 70 years ends and the 14 years begins. And in the beginning, it was Taurus, but also in the beginning was the beginning who was Christ. And they're exactly 50 days apart now. 
man, I was so excited when we got that one because I had asked. And you see what happens, guys. You guys know, been around for a while, how it works with me. It doesn't come by, thus saith the Lord. I don't get a, a visitation. I don't get dreams or visions. I get revelation from Scripture. And for me, that is even more powerful because it can be proven in His Word. And each and every one of you can go and see it and follow it for yourselves. Faith comes through hearing and hearing through the Word. It's awesome. All right. So now let's get into this. Let's go into 1 Corinthians 15. Okay. <clears throat> just, just look at the straightforwardness of this and try to think, uh, how could this, why would they think at the last trump it would be at the beginning? Okay. Listen to what it says. For in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Okay? Let me go into eSword, our beautiful trusted eSword. It's a free program or maybe a few bucks depending on your device. You can use KJV Plus and have all of the understanding of the words at your fingertips. A lot of people say, oh, it was man that divided the Gospels in chapters and in verses. It was man that added the concordance of the Greek and the Hebrew. Yeah, and it was man that wrote the Bible. You don't think the same spirit that led them to write the words is the same spirit that inspired these men to write the definitions and to, and to divide up the chapters and the verses? If you don't believe it, then you need to watch those intro videos. Because the revelation of the intro in the, uh, of the videos, the revelation of the Gospels, and the chapters to years will absolutely prove it's true. So let's let's check this out. Okay, but every man, see, at his coming. We're going to see this word in all of these places where this word is in these scriptures that we understand. And when you see the man, it's going to blow your mind. Okay, afterward, they that are his at his coming. We know this is all related to Matthew's discourse when the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. Then comes the end. Of course, then comes the end, right? It's at his coming feet down on the Mount of Olives. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. What kingdom is he de delivering up to God? Oh, let me show you. Revelation 21. For this to be coming down, God, Jesus had to deliver it up. Look at what happens. What do we know happens? When New Jerusalem is going to come down, look what happens. You have the Lamb's wife, right? New Jerusalem is the Lamb's wife descending from heaven from the Father. And it's the 12 tribes that represent the gates. It's the 12 apostles that represents the foundations. You see how fitting that was over in Luke 14, right? The apostles represent the spiritual foundations being laid during seals, right? While the disciples are there with them, doing, the, doing other work, right? Spreading the word, teaching, bringing people to safety, all sorts of things. And then you've got the walls that are represented as the 144,000. Well, the one thing you don't have are the seals workers, those putting their necks on the line and, and spreading the gospel as Priscilla and Aquila, right? Those who are putting their necks on the line for the Gentile churches, which means during seals. It's the Smyrna group, right? Those putting their necks on the line. Those who will not taste of the second death, right? That's the same group we were talking about over in Revelation chapter 20 who have part in the resurrection. So when Christ says, and then comes the end, well, he will have delivered up the kingdom to God. Well, here it is coming down. And it's the apostles, it's the 144, and it's the 12 tribes. It's all this worker group, that portion. You see? But the portion, the, the group that isn't there are the seals disciples because they remain with them during the millennial reign as well. They will always remain with the Lord. So look at what it says, deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father, 
when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. <clears throat> so when does he put down all authority and power to reign? Well, we know he does that in Revelation 11 at the seventh trumpet, at the 14 years as tribulation comes to an end. What does it say? Even heavens, uh, in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. That's why Matthew's gospel at the very end, he gives them the, the work to do and then he says, and I am now with you even until the end of the world because that was prophetic of him coming feet down and, for, and ruling throughout the millennial reign. This is what the conversation is. You see? Let's go back into 1 Corinthians 15. For he must reign till uh, he had put all enemies under his feet and the last to be destroyed is death. Well, what do we know about death? Go to Isaiah 65. In Isaiah 65, you guys will remember, whoops, uh, yeah, 65. Did I go too far? Yeah. Okay. New heavens and new earth. This isn't the end of the millennial reign, new heavens and new earth coming down. This is when he returns feet down, binds Satan, destroys the enemy, and then replenishes and repairs the earth. Look at this. I create a new thing. What does the word new come from? To rebuild or to repair. You see? Why? Because this is at the beginning of the millennial reign, right? When he's returned feet down. And what do we hear? In verse 20, it says, There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that has not fulfilled his days, for a child shall die a hundred years old. So, meaning what? It's going to be as it was in the beginning. They're going to be living hundreds of years again. But guess what? There's still death. So there is still death happening during the millennial reign, even though they're living for hundreds of years. Which means <clears throat> that 1 Corinthians 15 is telling you when he's coming, feet down on the Mount of Olives, and then the end comes when he delivers up the kingdom, he has all power and authority, and he all, now he's going to reign till all enemies are under his feet and the last one to be destroyed is death. When did we just see death and hell being destroyed? At the end of the millennial reign. It's everywhere, guys. It's everywhere. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are under him, it is manifest that he is expected which put all things under him. Okay, now God is coming down, right? Just like we see at the millennial reign. Now new heaven and a new earth, right? is coming down from above from the Father, New Jerusalem. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And it says, Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Then why are they baptized? For uh, Why are they then baptized? for the dead and why stand we in jeopardy every hour now i don't have complete clarity as to why in relation to this baptized but i believe it relates to the old testament even more so you read about this i believe it's in um in uh, uh, uh romans 11 okay so clearly when you see that you know he's given it to the gentiles right they've been cut off and he's given it to the time of the Gentiles. But eventually it will return back to them. And we see this connection to baptism being done there as well. So I believe it's uh, Old Testament uh, resurrection for those guys. And what's interesting, that might even be connected to some of us when we get baptized. I'm just throwing this out there. That maybe us getting baptized as well is something for the Old Testament Jews as well. Interesting, right? 
So then we see the resurrection of the body. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, even right here. This one blows me away when people say, well, see, this, this is pre-trib. It even says at the last trump, right? So it says in verse 15, 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 52. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. This is the last trump. What? When the Lord returns feet down at his coming as lightning. When he comes as light, that is lightning from one end unto the other. Wait until you see that revelation. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and, comma, and we shall be changed. Wait until you see where this all comes from. When you see it in Thessalonians this time, you're going to say, wait a second. You see, because what does it say? It's going to be at the last trump. The trumpet's going to sound. And who rises first? The dead are going to ri be raised first. Okay? Who are the dead that are being raised first? Those that are Christ at his coming. Well, who are the ones that are Christ's at his coming? Who are the ones that are Christ's at his coming? Those who are in the first resurrection. This is all Smyrna. It is the disciple workers who are going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. They're not part of the of the new Jerusalem coming down. This is the group that will rule and reign with them. They're gonna work during seals. They're gonna put their necks on the line. Some of them are gonna be killed and what? They're gonna be brought into synagogues, right? Uh, uh, sorry, they're gonna be brought, listen to this, this same wording here. Fear none of those things which thou shalt, shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried and have tribulation 10 days, but be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Who are the ones that aren't hurt of the second death? The ones who took part in the first resurrection. These are the ones being resurrected to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. It's perfect. And when is it? It's at the last trump. The dead shall be raised first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be changed. You see? That can make you a little bit nervous as a worker. <laughs> <laughs> you see, because I, I, I don't know <clears throat> that there's complete clarity to those SEALs workers, that Smyrna group, that Luke remnant bride worker, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know that there's absolute clarity that they're done at the end of SEALs, okay? And look at this wording. They're the ones that are going to be raised first. And we shall be changed. Well, who is this we that he's talking about? The church will tell you it's everybody. It's everybody. Everybody in Christ. They're all going to be changed. They're all lying in their graves and they're going to be resurrected at the end. <clears throat> no, they're not. The ones that died in Christ that that have already died in Christ the last 2,000 years. They're already in the third heaven. Paul proved it to us. He told us, I would much rather be gone to be with the Lord than to, to be here, but it's better for you that I remain. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 
Remember the last video, the one on the, on the right side of Christ, on his right? He repented in that moment and bam, Lord said he would be with them in paradise. Why would anybody in the kingdom of God need a new body? They won't. They won't. You're going to want to keep reminder of this one, this group raised from the dead and those that will be changed because you're going to see it in a very well-known piece of scripture. But you see, the church also will tell you this is the pre-trib. It is not. It is absolutely 100% post-trib when he returns at his coming feet down on the Mount of Olives. Which means there may very well be other places where the church tells you it's pre-trib, where it's not. And you're going to see places that we've talked about before in Luke. Remember, I shared with you guys something that Jared shared from, for us in uh, Luke chapter 20, right? The, the woman that had seven husbands, each died, remarried, died, remarried. Who's she going to be married to in the end, right? And he says, um, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, right? But they that shall be accounted worthy, we know that's the pre-trib group, and of the resurrection of the dead, which is this group, neither marry nor are given in marriage. But do you know what it says about them? It says they that shall be accounted worthy of that world, of that world. Pretty incredible, right? Have you ever heard that world? Have you ever heard of heaven being referenced as world? Never. Never. Those who will be accounted worthy of that world will neither marry nor be given in marriage and so forth. Wait till we get there. It's all about this right here. And it's all connected to the last trump when he comes as lightning. When he comes as light, feet down on the Mount of Olives, lightning, which is light from one end unto the other. Remember this. Watch this. So look at this. Look at this. This is all the places in relation to the word coming, okay? We've shown many times over the years the direct, absolute, 100% revealed reference as to why the, the, the coming of the Lord in Matthew 24 is 100% all about when he returns at the end, feet down on the Mount of Olives. You see? It starts in Matthew 24, 3. You don't, this is why the discourses are different. What shall be the sign of thy coming? Okay. This is when he returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives. End of the end of the world. You see? When he comes at the beginning of tribulation, not seen by everybody, it's not the end of the world. The end of the world is at the end. So, and you see it in four places throughout scripture, right? See? Look at this. For as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. That's the same wording we get, as you guys all know, from Luke chapter 17, when they're asking him again prophetically the coming kingdom. And what does he tell them? Verse 24. For as the lightning that lighteth out of one part of heaven and shineth unto the other part of heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. The day of the Lord. A single day. Okay? Lighteth. It's all about what? Bright shining. Okay? Bright shining. Light flashing. Okay? Look, it shineth. To shine. Give light. So when he's coming as light, as lightning, it's so exciting. So we know this. We've broken it down so many times, all right? We know when he comes 
and it's going to be as it was in the days of Noah. It's a literal reference to the typology in the in the final year that'll be as it was in Noah's flood, that time of about a year. Here we have it right here in 1 Corinthians 15 that we just shared. So there's five of them we directly know are directly related to when he returns feet down. This is about Paul and his coming. Okay, now we come to what? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5. <laughs> what are the chances? that this is the same context probably pretty good right well mike had shared in in the live show he had touched on it i've shared it on on the in the past but i'm going to bring clarity to this first thessalonians chapter four this time you're going to see the clarity of it this time and then you're going to be blown away by what's coming in first thessalonians five so what else do we have? We have the same context in 2 Thessalonians. By the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, those that were still alive. Okay? 2 Thessalonians 8. Same thing. Okay? And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. See, as lightning with the brightness as light. How about 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9? Listen to this. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Who is coming after Satan? Of course, Christ is, right? We all know this, even in the, in the chapters to years. The Lord is there on Mount Zion. They've rebuilt the city and the streets and the temple during the first three and a half years of trumpets. Satan is cast out. The pit is open. The Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan are there and people. And he gets to rule and reign for two and a half years. This is Satan's time with the Antichrist and false prophet. This is the Antichrist's time with the false prophet. Antichrist is killed at the end of the sixth year. False prophet isn't. Then only false prophet is here, but I'd say he's probably in hiding or whatever. His power and authority was taken away until Satan is cast down, having lost with his angels. The pit is open. Antichrist comes back. There's two, there's two and a half years they get to rule and reign and bring about absolute chaos on the earth until the Lord returns then, feet down, on the Mount of Olives, like lightning, like the brightness, like shining. And when is it going to be? After the period of Satan. Over and over and over again, we can show these things. Let's keep going. Um, Second Peter, let, let's go to Second Peter 3, 4. Okay. Second Peter. See, I think I had some of these up here. Ooh, that one's later, but that's connected too. Wait till you see that. Second Peter chapter three. Listen to this in Second Peter. You're gonna see more than one thing. Listen to this. Important to understand. Second Peter, uh, Chapter three, verse ten. Where was the first one? Let me let me just see. Was there a first one? Four, as well. Okay. Let's start in verse three. Second Peter three three. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, "Where is the promise of his coming?" In the last days, there's going to be scoffers saying, where is the promise of his coming? I'm going to show you something that is going to blow your mind from Matthew's discourse that we had never caught before. When you see the scoffers who are saying, 
Where is the promise of his coming? There is at least one server, and the understanding is awesome. Okay? Um, let's go to, we've covered a lot of that part in the past. Let's go to verse 10, because it's all about what? The day, singular, of the Lord. So, but the day of the Lord will come, listen to this, as a thief in the night. So, when is the day of the Lord? It's at his coming. The day of the Lord is at his, is at his coming. To the which he says, as a thief in the night. Okay? In the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Remember, he's going to renew the earth, right? Looking for, <coughs> uh, verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved. Nevertheless, we according to his promise. Okay? Remember, they, they were promised the millennial reign. Remember, if you go into the chapters to years and you go to Genesis, the first 21 chapters of Genesis have a typology to the first 21 chapters of John. And what happens in Genesis chapter 21? Isaac, the promise is born. Do you think that's by chance? Of course not. Of course not. See, it's all about where's the promise? Where's the promise? Where's the promise at his coming? They're going to scoff during the end of days. Wait until I show you one of the ones who scoffs. Exactly as we've taught it. Okay? So again, this is all about the day of the Lord. It's all at his coming. It's, it's the day of the Lord as a thief in the night. Okay? All of this is still directly connected to him coming feet down on the Mount of Olives. This one makes me nervous. <laughs> first John chapter 2, verse 28. Let's go to First John chapter 2, verse 28. Because remember what First John is written to, right? If we go to First John chapter 1, remember who he's written to. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. You see, this isn't only a reference to the apostles. It's the disciples who were with them for 40 days. This is the end time typology of the Smyrna disciples, Luke, remnant bride worker. So when we read chapter 2, it's a little bit nerve wracking. <clears throat> okay? Watch this. Go down to right from here. Little children, it is the last time, okay? It's the end of days. He's telling them prophetically. And as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come, okay? So it's the end of days. Antichrist is coming, but we know he doesn't come onto the scene fully until he gets his power to continue 42 months. But it says, even now there are many Antichrists, okay? whereby we know it is the last time or the end of days. What do we know about this? We come to Luke 21. And what does it say? As we know, verse 8, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and the time draweth near, go ye not after them. Okay? All this is connected to, where was I, First John, is connected to the beginning of the end of days. I believe even that war and be not terrified relates to the first attack at the 50 days in northern Israel that we've talked about many times as well. Okay, so Antichrist himself is still coming, but even now there are many, and that's how you know it's the end of time, right? The end of days. 
They went out from us. Verse 20. But you have an unction from the Holy One. And you know all things. Hello. Who is the group that is given understanding of all things? You got it. It's the Luke group, right? Luke chapter 1. Luke knew all things in order. Remember this. This is all connected to Thessalonians as well. Okay? So we know this group who knows all things. And that's connected to Luke chapter 1. That's the Luke remnant bride workers, uh, apostles even as well. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is Antichrist, that denieth the Father and the Son. Whoever, who, whoever denieth the Son, <coughs> the same has not the Father, but he that acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Let there... Let that therefore abide in you, which you have heard from the beginning. From the beginning. Remember, there are two beginnings, right? There are two beginnings. This is the beginning as the beginning of 50 days. And this is the beginning at the time of the end of 50 days and the start of the 14 years. So which group is a part of both? You could say the apostles, but more so the disciples, because they're the ones that were following him during the 40 and then receive that anointing, right? That unction, okay? That smearing, that Holy Spirit anointing that they receive on the 50th day, okay? That you have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you, but the anointing which you have received of him abides in you, and you need not that any man teach you. You see, we've talked about this in the past, right? Any of you don't need anybody teaching you? Everybody needs teaching still. Nobody knows all things yet. Clearly, this is prophetic. Was there a daily life application in the is before the is to come starts? Sure. But what did it just say? <clears throat> in the last days. Okay, in the last time means in the last days. So again, <clears throat> prophecy is all throughout it but as the same anointing teaches you of all things and is truth and is no lie and even as it taught you you shall abide in him and now little children abide in him that when he shall appear you may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his Oh, there it is. At his coming. Ah! <laughs> so remembering some of these key words as we go through all of this. Okay? So is there a potential that, that this isn't the same kind of group of workers? Right? Is this possible? We know that this is the SEALs group of workers. But when he gets down here, could it be that it's the trumpet workers? You see, there is um, potentially wording that helps clear this up for us, okay? You have little children, 38, 13 here. Immature Christians, you could say, but they're going to be anointed, right? And then you have now little children, which is 50, 40, which is an infant which means Christian converts. So it could be that this little children <laughs> is speaking to those during seals who we know as the 144 get the anointing during trumpets. It's possible. Okay? But we do see this as a potential that 
the seals workers may just also be here to the coming feet down on the Mount of Olives of the Lord. All right. <laughs> I don't say that to make everybody nervous and say, oh, I don't want to be a seals worker then. Remember, you're going to have understanding. You're going to have anointing. You're going to know all things. You're going to have healing powers and ability. All right. It, it'll, it'll be like, uh, hopefully not as bad as Paul, but Paul willing, so willing to, to go through all these things and all the pains and all the stuff that happened to him. Because why? Well, because he was with the Lord. The Lord visited him. He was anointed. He knew it. He saw things that he could not speak in describing them. When you have that kind of faith, you see what happened to Paul? Do you think Paul had faith? No. Paul didn't have faith, brothers and sisters. He had no more need of faith because he was in the presence of the Lord. Remember, this is something we've shared on a number of times in 1 Peter chapter 1. It's like this group of seals workers. It's this group that's been hidden. You see, a, the elect group in the foreknowledge of God. This group that's part of the inheritance reserved for them in heaven who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed. Look at this. In the last time. Look familiar? It's the same group. It's the same group. And what does it say about them? Okay? That your trial of faith is things that you've gone through until what? Until this time at the appearing of Christ, which is at the beginning of the 50 and then the 40 days. What happens to them? It says receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. What does that mean? When we've shared on it in the past, why, why do they have faith no more? Why is it the end of their faith? Because they were in the literal presence of their faith. You see? Why do we hope? Right? We hope that it's all true because we hope that we're going to soon be in his presence. But once you are, do you have hope? No, you know it. That's why I say Paul, Paul didn't have faith in, because he knew. Just like this group, it's going to be their, the end of their faith. They're being reserved for the end of days. And at the end of days, when they're going to be revealed, do you think they're going to need faith anymore? No, because they were in the presence of their faith. You see that? Every single part and piece talking about Christ in relation to the coming is all to when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. Look at this. Let's go into these Thessalonians. <clears throat> Look at this in Thessalonians chapter 2. Wherefore, we would have come to you even sooner. This is Paul, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Wasn't that interesting? Didn't we see the first group getting a crown is the group of Smyrna? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ? That is coming. <laughs> there it is again. And, and when Mike shared the other piece uh, with me the other day from Revelation 21, we briefly chatted on this and he was like, he's like, I'm, it's okay. I'm okay. He says, I'll work right to the end. No problem. All 13, 14 years, I'll work it. Do you know why he's so excited to work it? Because why? There will be no more faith for us. It won't matter. We'd be willing to endure what Paul endured. <clears throat> looking from the outside and looking at it now, uh, I don't know. <laughs> right? My prayer is that if I'm a worker, if many of us here are workers, my prayer is that we will have the strength. We will have the, 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 the power within us to endure all of these things. Well, we will. We will. You see, when we saw it there in, um, in, in, in 1 John 2, it said, you know, even if you continue, right? But this group will continue. There is never condemnation spoken against them. 
they will continue. You see? And the crown of rejoicing at his coming. So it's it sounds somewhat more to me. It seems to be leaning a little bit more that way. And it's interesting because our sister Petra, um, who I was telling you about earlier, she had said that, you know, she she has so many uh, she has dream interpretations that she's got been posting on her on her channel. She has written many books and many words of the Lord. I mean, it is phenomenal. And she's like overtime work doing this now. It's coming in fast and furious because of the season we're in. And she posts them in the forum and she has them on her blog and she'll sometimes share them in YouTube videos. Um, but it, it, it's awesome. But she had said that the Lord had made known to her that she was staying till the end. And I thought, no, you know, sure. OK, she's staying to the end. Maybe it's just some of them, right? <laughs> well, guess what? Maybe it is only some of them. In fact, it is only some of them. And you know why? Because some of them will have been put to death. Some of them will have put their necks on the line, having refused the mark where others, they were already in, in protected and in areas doing different things for the kingdom during that time. And many will still survive through to the end. So it's interesting that she said that before we even had this revelation coming to light that this Smyrna group may very well stay through to the end, those that survive. And that's why you saw that, right? Unto the coming of the Lord. Remember 1 Corinthians 15, right? The resurrection and then those who remain, they would be turned. But it's the resurrection what? It would be the dead in Christ first. And then those who remain. You see? That's important to know because the only ones who are going to be resurrected first are those who are Christ at his coming. Who are those who are Christ at his coming? They're his workers. It's his remnant bride. Is, is she going to be the only one here? <clears throat> is she going to be the only one? Just the remnant bride workers, right? Those that died who get to be in the first resurrection and those that live, they're going to be changed. Well, what about his, his wedding bride? What about what took place in heaven? Wouldn't they get to come down? You got it. You got it. There's three portions, right? There's three portions. There's those that were taken to the third heaven. Right. Is that wedding those that, that have been in Christ over the last 2000 years and those that will go pre trib. There's his remnant bride worker of which some will die and some will remain alive until that point. That's who he's talking about. I'm going to prove it to you. You're going to see it. It's going to keep rolling. <clears throat> Let's go into first uh, first Thess Thessalonians chapter three. Let me see if I've got the same highlights here in Esau. Uh, in, starting in verse 3. That no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. So there's a group appointed unto these afflictions, right? For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we would suffer tribulation. Who are the ones that would suffer tribulation? How about we go have a look into Smyrna again? Listen to this. I know thy works and thy tribulation and thy poverty. Why poverty? Because they gave up everything to follow the Lord. You see? Um, which, and I know, uh, uh, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. What are they suffering? Tribulations. Okay, they're suffering tribulation. Okay, so they were told beforehand that they were going to be in affliction and that they would suffer tribulation, even as it has come to pass. Okay. Uh, where was that? Let me see where that word was. 
verse 13. Yeah, see, I knew I didn't have it highlighted in this one. Like I said, see, I'm, I'm digging into things I haven't gone into very much, right? Uh, let's start in verse 12. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. Okay, you can look at this even as the, um, as the apostles talking to the disciples, okay? Like Paul was. Okay, um, even as we do towards you, to the end, to the end, he may establish you, your, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even the Father, listen to this, at the coming <laughs> of our Lord Jesus Christ, listen to this, with all the saints. How about that? How's that for another little glimpse for you? Okay? You have uh, apostles saying, look, love everybody. As, as you've seen in these examples for us, as you're going out and about in the midst of tribulation, do it right to the end, right? To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. That's pretty awesome, right? So what do you see? You see that there's going to be a group alive. We already know there's going to be a portion of them dead, and they're going to be the ones that are the resurrection, the first resurrection, and <clears throat> he's bringing a group with them. Now it starts to get exciting, right? Well, let's go to chapter 4. Let's see what chapter 4 has for us. Okay? Chapter 4, verse 13, is where we'll start. This is the one that a lot of people, uh, or that a number of people were asking about, but I know a lot of people wonder about. But chapter 5 is going to blow your mind. If you've never seen this understood, well, this will blow your mind as well. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, to the end. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Okay? Those that are asleep in Christ, don't worry about them, right? It's the ones that have no hope. They're, they're the ones that are they're, they're finished, right? Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep, okay? They're the ones that, sleep, that are asleep. So even them that sleep in, in, let me show you. Even them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Even they which sleep will God bring with him. You see that? He's going to bring them with him. The saints, right? All those that have already died in Christ. They're already in the third heaven. And those taken pre-trip are already in the third heaven. He's going to bring them with him. Now listen to this. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain. Who did we just share about being alive and remain? Didn't we just read that from 1 Corinthians 15 and also in, uh, 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 what was it, uh, 1 John 2? Right, that, that same typology? Unto the coming of the Lord. And that we which are alive and remain <coughs> unto, here it is, the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or go before them which are asleep. What did 1 Corinthians 15 say?
1 Corinthians 15 just told us All right, down here from uh, 51 and 52. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, the seventh trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised, incorruptible, comma, and we shall be changed. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is all about his coming, just as we proved in 1 Corinthians 15. It's the exact same story. It's the same thing that we read in, in like I said, 1 John 2. It's all about at his coming at the end. Listen to this. Actually, you know what? Before we get there, let me show you this in Christ. You guys all know this very well, 2 Corinthians, right? I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. This is that 50 days, okay? This is the above 14 years ago is the 50 days before the 14 years. See, these are those in Christ. And where do they go? It's going to be like a rapture, and they get caught up to the third heaven. So who is he bringing? You see, those who are in Christ. We see the same thing. You guys know this from Romans 8. <coughs> who are the ones in Christ? You see, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Who is this group, brothers and sisters? They're the spirit group. They're the, like our brother Mark likes to say, they're the Genesis 1 1ers, okay? 1 1 1 2. The spirit creation group. They are the sons of God. They are the adopted ones who are co heirs with Christ. And there's a specific group, workers too, isn't there? And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Now listen to this. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. With, with understanding I'm going to be a broken record, did we not just see who them are suffering with, with him? Who are those that would suffer tribulation with him? Clues and insight all throughout these books, guys. Okay? <clears throat> so listen to this. Uh, back to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And with the trump of God. Let's go to Revelation chapter 10. With the trump of God. Listen to this, verse, uh, Revelation 10, verse 7. And in the last days, again, see, because it's, it's going to be in tribulation, of course. <clears throat> and in the last days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. See, that seventh angel, when he begins to sound, what is he sounding? Go to Revelation 11. What happens? And he sounded at the seventh trumpet, which is the last trump. The seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And that's the millennial reign. So exciting. <clears throat> Let's finish up in 1 Thessalonians 4. Here it is again, verse 16. Let's continue verse 16 uh, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air 
and so shall we ever be with the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. What do you think this is? Do you realize the dead in Christ? How many times do I have to share it? It's a broken record now, right? The dead in Christ shall rise what? First. Isn't there a group? <laughs> Sorry, man, broken record, right? Isn't there a group that are what? Part of the first resurrection? You see, they are the dead in Christ who have part in the first resurrection. They will be resurrected first. And then those who remained alive shall be caught up with them in the clouds. This is when he's coming feet down on the Mount of Olives. They are still going in the clouds. He is coming on the clouds, but they are what? In the clouds, right? The clouds are, can also be a typology of the, of the witnesses, right? Like the cloud of saints. And they're forever going to be with the Lord. Do you understand? If they're forever going to be with the Lord, then they must be here during the millennial reign. Hello. Now, does that make more sense? You can't forever be with the Lord and not be part of the, res the first resurrection to rule and reign with him during the millennial reign. You can't be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, after this group is resurrected, unless you're what? And be here with them forever, unless you're here with them during the millennial reign. Does that make sense? This is all about post-trib. It's all about him coming feet down on the Mount of Olives. And the dead, there it is again, in Christ shall raise first. That's why he said in the other one, and those that are mine. The others are what? The Lord is bringing them with him. He's bringing a group with them. A group that is dead is being resurrected. And those that were alive and remained will be changed. It is not talking about the whole church. The whole church, billions of people over 2,000 years, or the, the, even those that during the greatest revival during seals in the human history of a billion two plus people are not going to be resurrected to rule and reign with them for a thousand years. Do you imagine a billion and a half people together ruling and reigning? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it ain't going to happen. That's not the storyline. It's so exciting. All right, we saw who they were. We explained who they were. Now watch this. Okay? We know who they were. I showed you the difference between who they were as well because they're not the apostles. They're not the 144, and they're not the 12 tribes, right? They can't be either of them because those represent the foundation, the walls, and the gates that are coming down as New Jerusalem at the end. They're not represented by those who are his, who are his co-heirs, right? That specific group which is Smyrna, okay? All post-trip. Now, it's gonna really start to change your thought process here because I was one of them. I was one of them for the longest time. This is the part I was telling you that for the longest time, I believed that I, I believed with, I just, ugh. but because I couldn't fully grasp it yet, I still believed this was the beginning. I'm about to prove to you, this has nothing to do with pre-trip. 
What? Oh, now you've gone off the rails. <clears throat> nope. It's not pre-trip. You just saw 1 Thessalonians 2, 3, 4, all post-trib. What are the chances of finding the Lord coming in chapter 5 of the same book? And trying to think that it's pre-trib? Let me show you. It's all in the words. It's all in the words. All right? Watch this. So we have 1 Thessalonians 5. We'll start in verse 1. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly. Okay? So there is a group <clears throat> that knows perfectly. Who is this group that knows perfectly? Well, just like we shared earlier, right? Those who knew all things. The group from Luke, the pre-trib group, right? And what does it say? Uh, Luke 1, verse 3. Actually, let's start even in verse 2. Luke's going to declare all things in order. In Luke 1, verse 2, it says, Even as they delivered them unto us, which were from the beginning, were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. He's talking about Mark and Matthew. He says, it seemed good to me also, having had, here it is, perfect understanding of all things from the very first. What do we know about the Luke group? They're going to have understanding of all things. We just showed it all in two places. And we know it from Luke 24, that their understanding was going to be get open to them. It's the Luke remnant bride worker having had perfect understanding of all things from the beginning. It's awesome. So we know again that it's what? That he's declaring this to the Smyrna uh, um, uh, servants, right? To the, to the Smyrna seals workers, the remnant bride. Listen to what it says. For yourselves know perfectly. Well, I could tell you this. <laughs> this, is, this is one of the reasons why this chapter had bothered me so much, and I really wanted to understand it. <clears throat> because it says that, that you're going to know perfectly. Well, so far, nobody has understood it perfectly. But within the revelation of everything we've been given from Genesis to Revelation, it would seem that we should at least have a better insight into this. And if it's been a thorn in me for so long, how fitting that it's coming in so late. Not that we have it perfect, but we can certainly have understanding of it now. That one And one day soon, very soon, this understanding is going to be perfectly known to them. But this is why I say, you know, let me go back a little sidetrack. This is why I say this in Luke 24. I've been saying it a lot over the years, right? In verse uh, 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. He only says this to this group. This is the remnant bride, 40 days with the Lord, right? Just like the resurrection story says. They're the ones that receive the anointing on the 50 days. They're the spirit filled in Christ, given the understanding of scriptures. And what have, I, what have I been saying? This is exactly what we've been revealing for five years. The first five books, prophets, and the Psalms. I've told you guys the story. I remember when we started, we had the Psalms and we were starting in the prophets, but I knew nothing. I very, very little in the Old Testament. The only thing we partly started to understand was the, the 14 years and the above portion revealed in the story of Noah. Outside of that, we didn't have the beginning. We didn't have the spirit group, the light group, the flesh group. I mean, we didn't have we didn't have the law. We didn't know any of those things. 
we didn't re, we didn't have the connection of Moses being the typology during seals and Joshua being the, the connection during the time of trumpets. I mean, all of these things that have come since. I was nervous when I understood this is what was happening here in this ministry. And we were just starting to get more into the prophets and yet didn't know about the law of Moses. I was nervous thinking, oh my goodness, if that's where we still have to go. Oh, now it's nothing, right? Now it's, it's, we've got it. We understand it. Do we have perfect understanding in it yet? No. But you know what I believe has been going on here? The preparation for all of this. That's why Smyrna were called 14ers. That's why, that's why Polycarp, who was the bishop of Smyrna, was a 14ther. And it just so happens, without me knowing any of that stuff, I've been calling us 14ers for over five years because of the revelation of the 14 years, whereas theirs was the revelation of the 14 days. And we're both called 14ers? Man. This is what we've been revealing. This is what has been opening to us in the understanding of scriptures. And when the Lord comes, that understanding will be made perfect so that nobody need teach you anything. That's what's coming. Will it be a shock and a surprise to people in this ministry? Better not be. This is why I believe so many of us are part of the of those seals workers, that remnant bride, Smyrna group. We're being prepared. Just, it, it makes complete sense. Can I say, thus say it, the Lord, it's absolutely true? No. Are the absolute connections and the obviousness of things we've been given and the Spirit revealing to us right on target, which was Taurus? These things are undeniable. So 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Let that sink in for a moment. <laughs> Let that sink in for a moment. For yourselves know perfectly. And here we are. Coming to the tail end, finally I'm getting revelation to understand it. And it says, for yourselves know perfectly that the day, remember everything we've been telling you, the day of the Lord, so comes as a thief in the night. Let's go back and have a look at 2 Peter 3 again. I'm almost out of coffee, but that's okay. It's almost 10 o'clock. Listen to this. See, knowing this, that in the last days, scoffers, right? The promise, you're going to want to remember this. The scoffers are going to be saying, where is the promise of his coming? <clears throat> remember what it's all connected to? It's all connected to his coming. And what does it say? But the day of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5 just said the day of the Lord will come as what? A thief in the night. Is the day of the Lord coming as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and melt with a fervent heat? Is, is this pre-trib? <laughs> nope. If you said yes, you're just not paying attention. We just went through all of this and it was all post-trib. Look for and hasting unto the coming of the day of the Lord, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the day of the Lord is a thief in the night. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 2 opens up with yourselves knowing perfectly, the Smyrna group, the ones that will be given the understanding of Scripture, who are being prepared, We'll know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. What? Right off the bat. So comes as a thief in the night. 
And that exact quote is in those two verses. The one of which we've already broken down is all post-trib. And the one before it, every other chapter, four, three, and two out of five, all talk pre post trip. Come on. Well, it gets even better. For when they shall say peace and safety, don't we all think peace and safety is, is what we're all waiting for? For when they shall say peace and safety, this word is about to blow your mind. Then sudden destruction cometh upon them as, what? As travail upon a woman with child. It's another reason, right? This right here, and this right here, and this right here, are three reasons why I had always leaned to the side of saying, okay, this must be pre-trip. This must be pre-trip. But the verse before it is all post-trip. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them as travail upon a woman with child. You're going to want to, you're going to want to see what comes about. We're going to break down a bunch of this in here. Okay. Upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. And they shall not escape. Okay? Let me show you. In Luke chapter 21. Are they going to get to escape? When destruction comes to Jerusalem? Just think on this. Luke 21. Remember, in Luke 21, starting in verse 20. This is about what? This is about the Lord being here for 40 days, warning as Jonah did. We've taught on it many times. I'm going to do another teaching on the 40 days here in the next video or two with a full breakdown so everybody can clearly see it <clears throat> with all the additional information we can add to it from when we did it in the past. What is he telling them? This is the typology of Jesus here, warning as the Son of Man. For 40 days. And what does he say? And when you shall see Jerusalem. Compassed with armies. Then know that the desolation thereof is near. Let them which are in Judea. Listen to this. Flee to the mountains. And let them which are in the midst of it. Depart out. And let not them. And let not them that are in the countries. Enter there into. Hello. What do they get to do? They get to flee. They get to escape. They get to run away. Right? And them that are in the midst to depart out of it. It never even dawned on me in, in the looking into this word. Because this said what? And they shall not escape. Well, in the beginning, they can escape. He's literally there warning for them to say you're about to be compassed about, which we know it's, is by Syria and those with Syria that will attack and destroy them and remove them from the land for seven years that will come at the end of the 50 days and begin the red horse rider in the 14 years. We know there are going to be some that escape. Scriptures even tells us when they flee to the mountains. That they're going to be all starving and they're going to be in, in, in just panic and desperation. Because he's angry with them, right? His wrath. This says, and they shall not escape. Well, that's contradicting what the beginning says in Luke. <coughs> where they will be able to escape. So, that's one thing. Something's not quite jiving there, right? Let's take it a step further. We covered this already with 2 Peter. We covered this with uh, Luke 17, right? In his day, 
compared to the 40 days of the Son of Man at the beginning. This is the Son of Man in his day, the day of the Lord, right? Well, let's have a look at the day of the Lord. Isn't that interesting, right? There's other scriptures back here, but look at this. It's only used one time in Zechariah. Look at this. 1 Thessalonians 2, 5, 2. 2 Peter 3, 10. The day of the Lord when he comes as a thief in the night, as it says in both, is literally when he comes feet down on the Mount of Olives in his day. How fitting is that? That Zechariah chapter 14. Let's go check it out. What do we know about Zechariah chapter 14? Those who have been around for a while, you know it like the back of your hands. But what's Zechariah 14 in the chapters to years? Bam! Seventh trumpet. What happens at the seventh trumpet? The Lord returns as light, as lightning, right? In brightness. From one end unto the other. Returns what? Feet down on the Mount of Olives. What Zechariah 14 start off with saying? Behold the day of the Lord. <laughs> Behold the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem, listen to this, to battle. Okay? This is the big battle, 4421. This is the battle at the end of tribulation, at the end of trumpets. This is the battle when he destroys all the enemies that come against and binds Satan for a thousand years. Okay? And then throws the false prophet and the Antichrist who had come back, throws them into the lake of fire. Okay? Listen. And the city shall be taken, and the house and the houses rifled. Listen to this. The women ravished, and listen, listen, listen. Half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the resident of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Half. In the seventh year of trumpets, at the Lord's return, what? Verse 14. And his feet shall stand, what? In that day. <laughs> they really drive it home, don't they? In that day, upon the Mount of Olives. This is when he returns, 14th year, 7th trumpet, feet down on the Mount of Olives. Okay? And what's he going to do? For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And he says in what? Half the city will be taken into captivity, and the other half shall not be cut off from the city. Huh. Do you know that if we go look that up in, <clears throat> in, the, in the Gospels, do you know that there's only one place in relation to the, the prophetic, directly prophetic in the discourses, where that's talked about? Half? half okay you see in Zechariah 14 he talks remember we've shared on this a long time ago but we share on it every once in a while you see for I will gather all nations to battle right which is this one 4421 and the city shall be taken and the houses rifled the women ravished and half of the city shall go forth into captivity and the other half the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when, meaning past tense, he fought in the day of battle. Here's the battle that he's about to do at the end of trumpets. And here's the other battle. What was this one? Do you know that this battle is the one from Mark, uh, sorry, Revelation chapter 6. This is this battle, okay? This is this battle, okay? Here's the wrath of the Lamb. Look at this. The wrath of the Lamb is 3709, <clears throat> okay? This is the Lamb's wrath. What does it mean? What does this wrath mean? In excitement, 
<laughs> you see, he's getting vengeance and it's indignation and in anger, but it's it's a reaching forth. He's excitement. It, it's in desire. Okay. Because he's in joy. <clears throat> Reach out after long. Because <laughs> he was what? He was on a man having taken a long journey. And now we're at the end of seals. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. And now we're at the end of seals. Okay. What is the. <clears throat> oh, sorry. And you know what? And this other battle, let me show you. This same battle that's going to take place is the same battle from Ezekiel 39 at the end of six years of seals. Right? This one right here. Right? The battle of Gog, uh, of Gog, of Magog. And what does it say? Okay. Verse 9. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and bucklers, the bows and the arrows and the staves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years. Okay. It's the same one we've shared it many times from 2nd Esdras. This is where he takes out a group of people, the pre-trib. This is bewilderment of mind to those that are left on the earth. Then red horse rider, they're going to make war against each other, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Then all these things that he said earlier in the, in the chapters. And then my son will be revealed, whom you saw coming up, out from, coming up from the sea. How interesting is that, right? After what we were talking about. And then what do you see? And every man shall leave his own land and the warfare they had against one another. And an innumerable multitude shall be gathered together, as you saw, desiring to come to conquer him. But what's he going to do? He's going to stand on Mount Zion. And he's going to destroy them. This is the end of the sixth year of seals when he comes on Mount Zion. This is not him coming feet down on the Mount of Olives. This is the one that Zechariah is talking about that as when he fought, past tense, okay? This is how you know they're burning weapons for seven years. For anybody that's new that hadn't seen this, this battle is going to take place at the end of the sixth year of seals, right at the end when he comes on heavenly Mount Zion. So they're going to burn weapons for the final year of seals, one, so that would be one year, two, three, Four, five, six, seven. So they're going to be able to burn weapons for seven years, the, the seventh year of seals, six years of trumpets until what? Until the final year. So they were burning weapons for seven years because they didn't need it. And then bam, the seven years are up. What do you think is going to happen when the seven years are up? I can tell you what happens. Ezekiel just told us. He's now going to have this second battle. See, then shall the Lord. This is probably the father, guys. <clears throat> shall go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Okay. You see this word battle? That's this one. This battle was the one for the Ezekiel 39 war. Okay? One is the battle. You may have won the battle, but I'm going to win the war. Well, it turns out the Lord is going to win the battle and the war, as we know. All right? This is that seventh year of trumpets. And I'm going to prove it to you with this word as well, as we keep going. And you see all of these connections to it. In fact, when we go to <coughs> excuse me, Revelation 11, Check this out. In Revelation 11, look at this. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Look at this. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come. You see? There's that same desire wrath as the Lord had in the first one. You see, when it's the Lord's wrath, and it's the Lord's anger, and his war battle that's coming, just as it was at the end of six years of seals, just as it will be in the seventh year of trumpets, in the 14th year from tribulation starting, these are the two wraths. These are the two wraths. These are the two wars. 
Ezekiel 39 and then Zechariah 14. In fact, it's not only Zechariah 14, you're going to see it's also connected to Isaiah 13. And wait till you see what's connected with Isaiah 13. You can say, what? <laughs> All this time, I thought 1 Thessalonians 5 was pre. Watch this. Okay. Now, look at the wrath when it comes to Satan. <clears throat> so, the Lord's wrath is a desire. It's an excitement of mind. When Satan is cast down, okay, and his wrath has come, right? It starts at the first woe, which is at the fifth trump. When he's cast down, opens up the pit, Antichrist comes back. Absolute chaos, worse than ever in human history, since the world began even. Worse than even mid-seals was when Antichrist got his power first. Look at this. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. Remember, his time is only two and a half years, right? And look at this wrath. 2372. This is the one used for Satan. And it means passion with fierceness, indignation. And look at the word for it. 2880. To sacrifice. To slaughter for any purpose. Obviously, not the same wrath that the Lord God has. You see? They're different for a reason. That's why having a program like eSword and having the Strong's Concordance at your fingertips makes a massive difference. It'll explode your understanding of Scripture. All right? So let's keep going. <clears throat> let's go to Matthew 24. Okay? When you see these connections now in Matthew 24, you're going to say, oh my goodness, just like I did. I had connected some of these things, not the first one I'm going to show you, but as we keep going, I had connected some of these other things to the wrong portion of time as well, and I'm going to prove it to you. But you see, when we get down here, all, of the, all three discourses have the same thing. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And then it goes on to say the information, okay? But of that day and hour knoweth no man. Uh, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming. There it is again, okay? Because at his coming, in that final year, it's going to be as it was in the days of Noah. It's going to play out in the, in the typology of the about one year that Noah's days played out. Okay, Noah has a dual thing, dual prophetic understanding in it, because it also is a big picture of the seven days, then the 40 days, then a few days to the to the raven and the dove, and then seven days and seven year seven days as seven years and seven years. Okay? It's it's absolutely awesome. You know what? Let me show you something for the new people. Because this, I remember when Jamie found this. Okay, so there's the end of the 40 days in the typology of the Son of Man. The raven, okay, the Ishmael, Antichrist spirit goes out first. This is the one he's going to compass about. This is the Ishmael, uh, uh, um, Syria, uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad, okay? The spirit of raven is going to go and enter into him first. And this is what? 40 days of the Son of Man are ended. What do we know there's left? About three days, right? From the 50. <clears throat> this is when the compassing about will start by Siri and those who are with him after the Son of Man has left. The compassing about takes place and then what? The dove is sent out. The dove will give the anointing to that, to that Smyrna worker group, that Luke remnant bride worker group. When the 50 days are over, the dove leaves and then what do you have? Seven days is years, seven days is years. What do we say begins the seven, first seven days? as years they're the beginning of the 14 years at the red horse rider when the affliction and tribulation begins well look at this the word stayed and the word stayed the second one means stayed it just means to wait and be patient like the word means but the beginning of the first seven the word stayed means tribulation pain travail sorrow it's the beginning of the 14 years of tribulation it's absolutely awesome that was an exciting find as well. So now look at this with Matthew 24. 
in Matthew 24, what were we talking about? Just let me remind you guys real quick. In Matthew 24, let's go back to Zechariah 14. Where is Zach? There's Zechariah 14. <clears throat> okay, day of the Lord. And what did he say? Half of the city would go to captivity and half would be uh, and half, right? The residue, which is the other half of the people shall not be cut off. Okay, so there's a half taking place. Look what happens at the coming of the Son of Man when he comes at his coming, feet down on the Mount of Olives. We know it's the days of Noah. We've explained that. Okay. And you know when the flood come. See, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Listen to this. Do you realize this is only in Matthew's discourse, not in Mark and not in Luke's? Then shall two be in the field and one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be girding at the mill. One shall be taken and the other left. Watch, therefore, for you know not what hour the Lord cometh. How many? Half. Half are taken and half remain. What did Zechariah 14 say? The same as the day of the Lord. This is when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. What did he say he would do? He's going to gather all nations in the battle. And then what is he going to do? It says, and half of the city shall go into captivity and the, and the residue or the other half of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Do you think that's just by chance that Matthew is the only one at his coming feet down on the Mount of Olives, half stays and half goes? Hello. Right? It's so awesome. <clears throat> and it gets even better. Okay? We know that it's the day of the Lord. We know it's at his return feet down. We know it's when he's going to have this big battle. This is the end. This is the second battle. Okay? And what do we see in this battle? It's the word, the Hebrew word 4421. Watch this. In fact, let me bring it up right here. Uh, day of the Lord. Okay, yeah, watch this. I was looking at other places with day of the Lord. And look at, at Isaiah 13, 6, okay? Watch this. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 13. Check this out. <laughs> starting, starting in verse 4. The noise of a multitude in the mountains, like a great people, a tumultuous noise, of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. That's exactly what we read in Zechariah chapter 14. He's going to what? Gather the nations together. The Lord of hosts mustered the host of the battle. 44.21. It's the same one. It's the same one. They cometh from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the Lord, and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. How will ye, for the day of the Lord, <laughs> I love it, is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Huh. It shall come as a destruction, like, like, a, like a sudden destruction? Like a, a, a sudden destruction, what? Like a sudden destruction when he comes as light, right? When he comes as lightning, as the brightness of his coming. Therefore, shall all hands be faint and men's hearts shall melt. Verse 9. Oh, no, no. Verse 8. And they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. 
What? All of these connections in all of these chapters and verses are reading the same as 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And every single one of them is the day of the Lord when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. <laughs> Behold, the day of the Lord cometh both cruel with wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Okay, and it goes on with the stars and everything else. Let's see, where else did it have it? Where else? Okay, it was six and nine. Yes, that's right, because it was the day of the Lord. Okay, day of the Lord, as a woman travaileth in pain, and the battle, which is the same battle as nations gathered together, it's the exact same story as Zechariah chapter 14, the day of the Lord, the battle when he gathers all nations together to come against. See that? And then to top it all off, we're able to take it into Matthew's, into Matthew's gospel and to see that 50% are taken, 50% remain. How about this? You guys might, might remember this. It never saves it. It always resets on me. But watch this. For those of you that would like to see this connection, this video right here, Joel in the is to come. Joel chapter one is pre and, and the worker group, right? That, that seals workers group, those that are with him for 40 days to the 50 days. Then you have the mid portion which is Joel chapter two, and then you have Joel chapter three, okay? Joel chapter three is post. We've got a great video that explains it. Watch this. In Joel chapter three, okay? This is very important. There's a reason for this connection. Listen to this. In Joel chapter three, it says, let's start in verse one. For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel. Listen to this. Whom they have scattered among the nations. Listen to this. And parted my land. Do you realize they couldn't have parted his land during seals, guys? Do you realize there is no pre-trib parting of the land? This is something we have been seeking and understanding for so long. All because of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Because they have scattered his people among the nations and parted his land. Do you know why it can't? Because in Zechariah chapter 8, what do we know happens? Do you remember the land has to rest for seven years? And in it, they're only going to lay the foundation of the temple. And the rest is all, the land is resting. In chapter 8 of Zechariah, which is the beginning of trumpets, the Lord has returned on Mount Zion, not feet down on the Mount of Olives, but on heavenly Mount Zion, which is the mountain of the Lord, where the rapture group is going, the mid-trib rapture group. And what does he tell them? He says in verse 9, Thus saith the Lord, Let your hands be strong, you that hear in these days these words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. For before these days, there was no hire for man, nor any hire for beast, neither was there any peace to him that went out or came in because of the affliction. For I set all men, everyone against his neighbor. What is this? Red horse rider, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. I had said everyone against his neighbor, so there was no ability 
to come back and build or any of it outside of the foundation. Why? Because the land we were told in Leviticus 26, it must rest for the seven times. It must rest for seven years because of their desecration of the land, because of their disobedience since having Jerusalem. It has to rest for seven years before he can build the temple. And when he comes at the end of seals to start trumpets, at the start of trumpets, they're building the temple. <clears throat> Do you think, it, it didn't even dawn on me. Do you think, honestly, I mean, I can't believe this didn't, it, it, it never dawned on me till today, till tonight. Do you honestly think that the Lord would come back and build his temple at the beginning of trumpets if they had parted his land during seals and built on it themselves? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So when we read Joel chapter 3, and we see it's all about the end and the war, the battle that he's bringing everybody against. What's he telling them? What's he going to do? It says, because they scattered them among the nations, comma, and parted my land. So when can the parting of land take place? When? I, sometimes I pause long and it sounds like I'm waiting for an answer. I know it's rhetorical. Okay. When they have scattered my people and parted my land. If it couldn't have happened during seals, <clears throat> because then if they part it, what does everybody expect? The church will tell us that they're going to divide the land. Why? So that they can rebuild the temple. So they'll have the, the Arabs on one side, uh, right? The Muslims on one side and the Jews on the other. And that the temple is going to be built during the first three and a half years and then Antichrist is going to step in, but that it was Antichrist that built it. We know it's not Antichrist building it. We know the Lord is going to be here on Zion. We know Daniel chapter 9 is, he is the son of man. It's Messiah, the prince, capital M, capital P, during the first three and a half years. <clears throat> we know that he's the one that's going to make a covenant with all people. And in Zechariah 11, at mid-trumpets, he's got to break that covenant, and he breaks it in that one day. When he returns in the final year, he's going to renew that covenant after he destroys the enemies. So then where's the evidence that this happened at the time of mid-trumpets? It had to happen sometime mid-trumpets to the end of trumpets. Do you know we know exactly where it says when they scatter his people among the nations? Watch this. Uh, Daniel. Our brother Daniel. We have a brother Daniel. Where is brother Daniel? Oh, is he in the Netherlands? Sorry, brother Daniel. I know you're up over there somewhere. So here's in Daniel, okay? What do we read in Daniel? In verse uh, Daniel 12, verse 6 and 7, okay? This is where he's crying out. He's like, man, how long is this stuff with Satan going to last, <clears throat> right? This, this time that's been worse than it'll ever be, right? Where is it? This time of trouble that has never been since there was a nation. Okay, this is mid-trumpets. And the answer is, verse 6 and 7, And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? Okay? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. 
We have taught you what this means. It's the same time frame as Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, where it says time and times and half a time. That's the full three and a half years, the final three and a half years of trumpets. But Satan's time is only one, two plus a half. That is two and a half years of the final three and a half years. Because what happens in that final year? The Lord has returned feet down on the Mount of Olives. That's why it's the beginning of, of uh, Zechariah chapter 14. That's why when the Lord returns at his coming, is that final year like Noah? Okay, listen what it says. Time and times and a half. So during these two and a half years with Satan's rule, when Messiah is cut off, after they had rebuilt the temple in the first half of trumpets, Satan's cast down, the Antichrist comes back, there's a battle and a war that lasts two and a half years, some sort of spiritual thing, realm thing going on in this battle. And listen to what it says. And when he shall have accomplished what? to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. What did it say in Joel chapter 3? Whom they have scattered among the nations, comma, and parted my land. They can't actually divide the land during seals, guys. The land's going to be destroyed, right? Remember in Jeremiah chapter 4? He tells them he's going to destroy them and destroy the land, but not fully, right? And destruction shall come suddenly in the moment. Uh, the sound of the trumpet. Da, 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 da. Verse 27, for thus saith the Lord, the whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full end. Okay? The heavens above it are going to be black. The whole city shall flee from the noise of the horsemen and the bow. This is at the red horse rider, the beginning of the 14 years when Jerusalem is destroyed. But he's not going to make a full end of it, of course. He just needs it to now rest. He needed them off the land. It's so awesome. So in understanding these things and knowing that there's a scattering in those two and a half years, to me, it would also make sense that having parted his land takes place at that time as well. You see? Remember, Antichrist is going to enter in and Satan's going to be there. The pit is open. This makes sense at the parting of the land. Just, just ponder that for a moment. Why would, they, why would there be the division of it at the beginning of seals when he comes at the end of seals and they start rebuilding during trumpets? You think, he, you think it's going to be land that was divided? And now he's going to punish them for scattering the people and for dividing his land after he'd already been there and rebuilt the city and the temple. The Lord obviously isn't going to be, be building the temple on divided land. You see, it's the church in their misunderstanding of prophecy that has ingrained these things in us. This is sometime in the second half. This is all the second half of trumpets. And the evidence is when he's gathering them to destruction and when he's doing it in the day of the Lord, when he's doing it when as a woman in travail and he's bringing sudden destruction upon them. <coughs> Wait till you see that word for sudden destruction. Okay, listen to this. Verse 9, Joel 3, verse 9. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. There it is again. There it is again, the exact same one. The same one from Zechariah 14 
and from Isaiah 13. Prepare war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near and let them come. Listen to this. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears and let the weak say, I am strong. Remember what we said earlier? They were burning those weapons for seven years. At the end of seven years, see, there was a battle here. At the end of this battle and when these wars are stopped and they come against Christ, bam, the war is done. They're burning weapons for seven years. At the end of seven years, what does he tell them to do? It's like, it's like the rest of their, their, their spears and their swords and their weapons. He's saying what? Those spears and those swords and weapons that you had turned into plowshares, time to turn them back into swords, back into spears. Why? Because it's that final war. It's that final battle. You see, he tells us in Zechariah 14 that the Jews, right, those that he's gathering that are strong for him, okay? Where is it? Living water, Jerusalem. And look at, look at this. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. And in that day, there shall be one Lord and his name one. See, same thing we were reading in the other place. Um, da -da 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 Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And here it is in verse 12. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord shall smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall be consumed. All right. All of this happening. Verse 14. And Judah also shall fight at Jerusalem. And the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel in great abundance. You see, they're going to fight as well. Those plowshares are being turned back into swords. It's so awesome. And it's all this connection with the day of the Lord. It's all the end. Look at this, okay? How about the word thief? Check this out. This gets so exciting. Let's go back into 1 Thessalonians 5. Okay, so we just saw what? They're gonna be in pain as travail upon a woman with child, right? So we have, we have yourselves know perfectly the day of the Lord, so comes as a thief in the night. When they shall say peace and safety, sudden destruction is coming upon them. I'm going to show you this sudden destruction. Okay. You see this word for sudden, I'm going to get here in a minute, is only used twice. One means suddenly or sudden and one means unawares. Wait until you see these definitions. You see, with one being sudden and one being unawares, there is a separation in their understanding. Okay, it's like seeing, it's like seeing, um, um, you know, sometimes you'll see uh, the same word or a different word and like this, and it has the same definition, but there's more than one definition connected to it. Look at that. There's definitions connected to it. Well, in other cases, it might be different, uh, a same word, okay, and the same meaning. So it's got one meaning and it's got, it, it's got this word used all over the place. But sometimes it'll have different words and you go and look it up and the meanings might have a multiple type of meaning to it. But in the context, they are a coming. Okay. There, it's, in this case, it is a something sudden. It is a something unawares. But the definitions in them is the reason why one is used as sudden and the other one is used as unawares, and I never caught that before. When you see it, you'll understand. Okay? But look at this. Um, so cometh as a thief in the night. Well, now we know this thief in the night is connected to the day of the Lord. Okay? Let's look at this word for thief. This word for thief, okay, in these police places, uh, and were thieves, were not break. Okay, this isn't the context we're looking for. This one is. Okay? But know this, Matthew 24, 43. What's Matthew 24, 43? Watch this. 
Matthew 24, 43 is, huh, it's directly connected to the time of the coming of the Lord. <laughs> right? Here's the coming of the Lord, the seventh year of trumpets. The half are taken away and half remain. Verse 43 goes in to say, but know this, that if the good man of the house had known in which watch the thief would come, he would have watched and he would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour you think not the Son of Man cometh. Do you know that this is also only in the discourses found in Matthews? So what do you think that means about thief? What do you think that means about thief? The word for thief in the discourses is only found in Matthew and it's directly connected to the year, the final year of the Lord's coming. Isn't that so far the exact same context again as 1, Corinthians, uh, as 1 Thessalonians 5? We'll check this out. Now we're going to go into Luke 12. When we go into Luke 12, it's going to blow your mind. See? Look at these places where it is. And, of course, it's in 2 Peter 3.10, just as the day of the Lord was, and coming as a thief in the night, all to the final year of trumpets. Let's see what Luke's context is. This is going to be so much fun. Okay? So what are we seeing? Again, thief related to the final year. Let's go into Luke chapter 12. Remember what this was saying here, right? If he had known what time the thief would come, he would have prepared, right? That's the Lord. He's giving it in the context of himself coming as the thief in the night. Listen to this. Remember, I said I was going to show you this again. Luke chapter 12, verse 35. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning as you yourselves like men that wait for the Lord when he will return from the wedding. Okay? This is that Luke 14 when he's gone to the first wedding banquet. That when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. This is when he returns from the wedding. And when he returns from the wedding, what's he going to do? He's going to have a great, excuse me, a great banquet with these guys. Okay? And we know who they are because it says they would be part of the resurrection of the dead as well. It'll be the alive and those dead. Verse 37. Blessed are those servants. Whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down and meet, and will come forth and serve them. This is the, uh, uh, the banquet after the wedding, when he comes to start his 40 days. And if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know, that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Uh, what was this? What was this? Do you know what this was directly related to? Of course you do. I just showed you. All right? Check it out. Check it out. Matthew 24, at the Lord's coming. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known at what watch the thief would come, he would have watched. You see that? You see that? Oh, I've got a double surprise for you. Because there was more than one revelation in all this. There was a number of them. Do you know who these servants are? Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? This is all about what? 
the servants. Do you understand what's being said here? But know this, that if the good man of the house had known what time the thief would come, do you know who this, who this group of people are? They're the second watch. Hello. They're the second watch, brothers and sisters. Who are they? Remember? Those servants. Just, just like the end of each discourse. Each discourse? No. Only Mark and Matthew's discourse. You'll see why. Okay. Who are these that are the second watch? If these are the first watch that are with them for 40 days and then he sits and eats with them and they remain during seals, then who would they be? They would be the servants at the end of seals when he comes at the end of seals on heavenly Mount Zion. This is when he comes on Mount Zion. Okay. Notice there's no days of Noah because days of Noah is the final year of trumpets when he comes. What does he say to this group? Do you know who this is? You're going to see no condemnation here. Do you know why? Because this is the Smyrna remnant bride group who he gave authority to while he was on a long journey. Check it out. Take, take ye heed, watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. For the Son of Man, uh, for the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh. Eve, uh, at even or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping, right? So don't be found sleeping. Keep watching, right? And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Do you see any condemnation here? Do you see anything spoken negatively to these guys? Nope. He left for the six years of seals to the seventh year, and what did he do? He left his house and gave authority to his servants. Who are these servants who were given authority, brothers and sisters? You got it. They're the, they're the same Luke 24 group we keep talking about. It's the Smyrna group. They're the ones working during seals. The ones that he opened their understanding to. The ones who have understanding of all things. Who have nobody needing to teach them. Because they have the anointing of the Holy Ghost during seals. So what we're seeing. <coughs> at the end of Mark's discourse. Is this Luke remnant bride Smyrna workers who he's saying that when he comes, hey, these are the ones who I gave my authority to. And there's nothing negative said about them. Only that they're to keep watching. Well, it gets better. Because in Luke chapter 12, we see then the second group. Right? The, the, the one that's the second watch. Who's the second watch? Well, the second watch are the 144,000. And the 144,000 are working during what? Trumpets. They're working during trumpets, right? <clears throat> so who is this conversation to? And this know that if the good man of the house had known at what hour the thief would come. He's telling this to the second watch. The 144,000. 
the ones working during trumpets. When he returns as the thief in the night. Listen to what he says about them. He keeps going on. Be therefore ready also, for the Son of Man comes in an hour when you think not. Listen to what Peter says. Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us or even to all? I have wondered what this meant for a long time. I knew it was a mystery to understand. <clears throat> Why is Peter asking this? You see, because Peter's like, oh, whoa, wait a second. You know, this coming as a thief and, and, and not watching and being, is this, is this all to us? Or is it part of it to us and part of it to others? Because it's not to Peter. This only goes to the end of seals. And this is trumpets. And we know because it's at the end of Matthew's discourse when the Lord comes as lightning, as light, as brightness. That's why, again, it's about him coming as a thief in the night, which is why the thief is here. And it's the same story from the second watch coming to an end at the end of trumpets in that seventh year. And then he says in Luke 12, 42, and the Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make rule over his household to give them their meat? their portion of meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord when he cometh shall so find doing. Of a truth I say unto you, Luke 12, 44, that he will make him ruler over all that he has. 45, check this out. Listen to this. But and if that servant. So this is some servant, okay? This means it's either a seal servant or a trumpet servant. Well, we know it's not a seal servant because there was no condemnation for them at the end of Mark's discourse, which is the end of the six years of seals that the Lord's coming on Mount Zion. So let's see what it says and see where it connects. But and if that servant, so there's going to be at least one, a, a servant or some servants, say in their heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. Ring a bell? Ding, ding, ding. Didn't it say, some would say, the Lord delayeth his coming and go about drinking? And go about drinking? And if, but and if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to meet, uh, to beat the men servants and the maidens and to eat and listen to this, drink and to be drunken. I had always connected <coughs> First Thessalonians chapter five pre-trib to Luke and the time of the 50 days of the anointing of the Holy Ghost, that they were a type of drunk. We knew they weren't drunk. It was drunken in the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> but the context of 1 Thessalonians 5 is not about the Holy Spirit type of being, appearance of drunk. It's about being drunk. Who is that servant that is drunk? That says he delays his coming. Let's go have a look. We know it's not in Mark. We know it's not in Luke. In fact, Luke doesn't have any of this context about this worker group. Because their portion doesn't come until the end of seals. Remember, it already started up here. But before, this is while they're with him for 40 days. But their portion of the anointing of the Holy Ghost at the 50th day is the beginning of Mark's discourse, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. That's when they start their work after the Lord's gone and they receive the anointing as we saw in 1 John 
from the Holy Ghost to be understanding, being given of knowledge and understanding of all things. So when we come down here, it has nothing to do. Remember I said this verse is in all three. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. It's not the same. These guys are, you know, suffering and drunkenness and cares. He's talking, this is just about the sleeping church, the world that's not paying attention. And it's going to come as a snare on all of them. Oh, we're going to get to this context, don't you worry. Because this is the other place where the word unaware is connected to suddenly is found. I'm going to break it down for you. But I'm going to show you a mind blower revelation first. So we know it's not Luke. We know it's not Mark. And the reason it's nothing discussed about it, even in, for these guys in Luke, is because they had part in the 40 days with the Lord. But then their portion begins at the beginning of Mark's discourse. And when he comes on Mount Zion and finds them, you know, that they had better not be sleeping, but they're anointing, they've been given the authority over his house. So if it's not in Mark <coughs> and the thief from Luke 12, was in Matthew, what do you think the chances are, <clears throat> excuse me, what do you think the chances are that the one who says delaying his com coming and starts to beat on other servants and begins to be drunk is found? Do you think maybe it's connected to the 144,000? What? Remember, we know it's the 144,000 who are working trumpets. So when he comes at the end, at the seventh trumpet, and it's at his coming feet down on the Mount of Olives, which is this word <clears throat> for coming, because it's the feet down on the Mount of Olives one, which is half taken and half remain, which is as a thief, Listen to what it says. The faithful ones and wise servants, right? He will make ruler and, and, and give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant who, when his Lord comes, finds him so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Now listen to this. Listen to this and remember what we've been teaching about something that we know happens to one or some connected to the time of trumpets that we have said have to be connected to some of the 144,000 or at least one of them. Guys, you remember what happens? Something happens to the 144,000. Remember this? Let me show you this. Remember the 144,000 the 144,000 who start off on Mount Zion with the Lord because he had come at the end of seals on heavenly Mount Zion, they have what? They have the Father's name written on their foreheads. They have the Father's name written on their foreheads. And we know and we've taught that their priestly line, they're all from the priestly line from among the tribes. How do we know this? Because it's represented by Aaron. Remember Moses and Aaron, they were responsible for striking the rock twice. The Moses one was Christ the first time when he came. And it's Aaron, the one that's the responsible one for the second time. Aaron was the high priest. Christ is the high priest above Aaron, the greater name than Aaron. And what ended up happening to the other priests under Aaron, all of his sons and so forth? They were all killed, right? Well, these 144,000 who are the priestly line and the typology through Aaron as Christ, but Christ the greater, this is the priestly line that are with the Lord, follow him wherever he goes, right? And what happens? We know something at some point happens to at least one of them who is like a Judas type. And there's a responsibility for what? The strike, the, the, the rock being struck again. It's all the story of the again that we've taught on. 
And it's because of this priestly line, not all of them, but because of that servant who's not watching and who will get drunken. It's at least one. It's at least one Judas, which is why Matthew has the story of Judas being paid the 30, the 30 pieces of silver and why Zechariah chapter 11, which is the same mid-trumpets cutoff time when the 30 pieces of silver for the Lord are given. Judas is the typology, and within it, that Judas is coming from among the priestly line of the 144,000. But guess what happens? Remember we shared this in Hebrews chapter 6? Okay? Starting in verse four, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. You see that? The 144,000 were standing before the father on the throne on heavenly Mount Zion. They were sealed with his name. They can't be left. They can't be left. They have to be saved if something they do wrong. And what, what's the only way to save them? If they've already been partakers in all these things. Hebrews 6.6, 6, if they fall away, which I'm about to show you is exactly correct. Now we can identify them. If they fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God again. Afresh to re-crucify and put them to an open shame. The Son of Man must do it again because of at least one servant during trumpets who is of the priestly line, who historically we have seen cause the second strike, which is him doing it again to fulfill it, to cleanse them all. <clears throat> Let's go to Matthew, which is related to the trumpets, 144,000, and look at what it says. Matthew 24, verse 48. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. Want to understand who that was talking to? When Peter said, are you talking to us, Lord, or to everybody? Who are you talking to? He's talking to the second group of servers, of servants, that second watch group, who are the 144,000, who we have read during that time would say there are some who delay uh, there are some who say the lord delays his coming and listen what he goes on to say and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken and shall cut him off, right? And of that servant shall come in a day and hour that he's not aware and shall cut him asunder and appoint his portion with the hypocrites and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. <clears throat> Look at this. He shall be drunken, drunk with the drunkards, right? Now let's have a look at this. It's the day of the Lord to which a group now knows of it perfectly. And at the day of the Lord is when he comes as a thief in the night. Matthew 24 is the time of the day of the Lord. Zechariah 14 is the day of the Lord. Isaiah 13 is the day of the Lord. Him coming as a thief in the night is as the day of the Lord at his coming. 2 Peter 3.10 For when they shall say peace and safety, which means they're going to have to say peace and safety at some point in the second half of trumpets, probably the later half, 
like the the second half, but right towards the late later half of trumpets. Then sudden destruction shall come upon them as travail upon a woman with child. Job, uh, 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 um, Joel chapter 3. And they shall not escape, which we know some are escaping at the beginning, which this group isn't escaping. So it's not the beginning. Listen to what it says. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4. But you, brethren, are not of darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are children of the light and children of the day. You are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. See, they're not all going to sleep. They're not all going to be drinking. They'll be sober and watching, majority of the 144,000, probably virtually all of them. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that are drunken, are drunken in the night. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. See? Hath not appointed. Now this could be what wrath? This could either be the wrath of the Lamb at the beginning of, of, of seal, uh, at the end of seals, or it could be the wrath of the Father that we showed is in the seventh year of trumpets. In light of everything spoken about here being to these workers, what do you think this wrath is? This is the wrath of the second attack, the, the second war of Zechariah 14, of God and his wrath at the seventh seal in the seventh year of trumpets. And they that are drunken, that are not watching, are not the ones in the actual not drunken, but in the appearance of drunken from the beginning of 50 days who are Holy Spirit filled, these are the drunken or the drunken one who has not watched but is fallen away as an evil servant that says the Lord has delayed his coming and goes and starts drinking so that what happens? The Lord of that servant shall come in a day that he looketh not for him. He's not watching. He's with those not watching. He's saying the Lord is delaying his, com his coming. And he's getting drunken with those that are drunken in the night. When? When the Lord comes as a thief. Brothers and sisters, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 is not pre-trib. It is post-trib. Now watch this. Okay? You see? Now we had this what? This, this peace and safety, right? When they're going to declare peace. They'll have scattered the people in the final two and a half years. They're going to declare a peace and safety at that time which when the Lord returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives, which tells me they're probably going to declare it after they kill the two witnesses right at the end of the sixth trumpet. And they'll declare this peace and safety because remember what they do? Let's go to this real quick as we wind this down. Remember what they do at the, um, at the, end, of the, at the end of the seventh, uh, the end of the sixth trumpet? Three days, the great voice said, come up hither. Where is it? Is it nine? Right? What happens when they kill the two witnesses? Right? Where is it? Well, you guys know. I haven't looked that up in a bit. Where they give gifts to each other, right? 
So after the two witnesses are killed, we know they're, they're celebrating, they're giving gifts to each other because that's probably the time of the declaration of peace and safety. And when that happens, the Lord will come sudden. Then sudden destruction shall come upon them as travail upon a woman, like we saw in Joel chapter three. Everything is post. And every chapter before it in First Thessalonians is all post. So what about this word, sudden? This word that we said shows up twice, and the other one is right here in Luke chapter 21, right? We've now found the evidence that it is of the 144,000, a servant, which is the evidence that it's one of the 144 at the end of trumpets who has done this. And what does that cause? It's the one that causes the again. Watch this. It's the, the typology is all right there. Look at what uh, Luke 21, 34 says. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with the suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that that day come upon you unawares. Okay? For as a snare shall it come upon all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Remember what we know about these accounted worthy? These accounted worthy and those workers who are part of the accounted worthy. Right? Here's the story of the resurrection. Right? The woman with uh, married seven times and all that. But they which shall be accounted worthy. It's the only other place you find accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead. Neither marry nor are given in marriage. You go to Mark's version. Uh, is it 12? You go to Mark's version. And you see right here, for when they shall rise from the dead, they neither, it's not, see, it's not the resurrection of the dead, it's different. Neither shall they marry, nor be given in marriage, but are as the angels of heaven, have you not read? You see that? There's no, there's no worthy of that world. And when you go to the one in Matthew, it's the same thing. They do err also in being accounted worthy of that world. Okay? It's those who have part of the first resurrection and those who were taken pre-trib in the accounted worthy. So we know this from Luke 21. That we, We've understood that for a long time in this portion right here. We know it's coming as a snare, but watch this. Look at the word unawares. So in Luke 21, 24, this is the beginning of everything, okay? This is all about the pre-trib escape and not being caught off guard with all these things, okay? To be accounted worthy, to, to, to escape everything pre-trib and to stand before the Son of Man. There's the word awares, or I should say unawares, and the word sudden, okay? The one that is pre-trib is unawares, okay? so that that day come upon you unawares. Don't be caught off guard when it comes, right? That's why you gotta be watching and praying, see? Watch ye therefore and pray always to be accounted worthy to escape everything. So this unawares meaning what? Non-apparent, an unexpected, unapparent, okay? Unexpected suddenly, but in a non-apparent way. Do you know what that means? Because he's coming unawares. He's coming in a way the world will not see the Lord coming and saying, ah, oh, come up to me, everybody. The world's not gonna look up and say, oh, oh my goodness, is that Jesus? No. Remember, the pre-trib is the greatest of the mysteries of all of them. The pre-trib is a sudden escape. Is a sudden escape. It's the one we were showing you here in 2 Esdras. When he comes and will deliver, the, the Most High will deliver those who are on the earth. 
and then they're going to plan to make war. See, then it'll start 50 days later, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. The one in 1 Thessalonians 5, check this out. Watch this. Remember when he comes in uh, Luke 17? In Luke 17, he tells us, for as lightning lighteth unto one end to the heaven, right? So shall he be in his day. So he's coming as lightning from one end unto the other. When we go to Matthew's discourse, yes, into his discourse again, we're going to see the exact same thing. What is it? Verse 27. Yeah. Verse 27. Listen to this. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Okay, so he's as lightning at the brightness. We saw it in the other one, at the brightness of his coming. So he's coming as bright, shining light. Okay, so when we come back into 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we now know this timing is being post, what is this sudden destruction that's coming? The first one is coming as unawares. Unawares is connected to unapparent, non-apparent. It's the mystery of the pre-trib. In fact, that's exactly what Romans 16 tells us, right? Romans 16 says, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. This is a prophetic typology in it to the pre-trib, but is now made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. What was made known to all nations for the obedience of faith? The pre-trib mystery that was kept secret. It's the pre-trib mystery that was kept secret. You see, you see that it's this group that's taken, uh, um, that was taken pre-trib, who were those who were what? Faithful, right? For those who had obedience in faith. And then you've got the workers, Priscilla and Aquila, as the Smyrna group, who are ready to lay down their necks for the churches of the Gentiles, the workers of seals. So when we come back here, and we're looking at, well, what's the difference between unawares being non-apparent, a a, a, and unexpected, the world is asleep. They're not watching, they're not praying. But there is a group who is watching, who is praying, who is diligent, who is obedient and faithful. Bam! That's the group about to be taken at the beginning of 50 days. That's the unawares. That's going to catch the world off guard. What's the sudden? Are you ready for this? Okay. There's the second time it's used. Look at this. Watch this. It comes from 33, G, 53, sorry, 16. To lighten, to shine, to show and appear and shine. Do, do, do we know somebody? Do we know somebody like that who's going to shine as light? Who's going to be manifest to lighten and shine? Who's going to come at the day of his coming, feet down on the Mount of Olives, as lightning, as the brightness of his coming, shining when he returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives? This is this sudden destruction. After they have claimed peace and safety, after the two witnesses have died, after they have scattered the holy people for two and a half years. When he comes as a thief in the night and they're in travail as upon as a woman with child. It's all post-trib, brothers and sisters, to the wrath coming of the Lord God in the seventh year. Then he says, listen to this. I'll take it. This will take us right to the end now. Now, I haven't been looking at the time. It's probably well over three hours. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you 
and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Okay? This is all to everybody now, right? Throughout the whole period. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, uh, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. Prove all things. Listen to this. Skip down to verse 23. And the very peace and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray your whole spirit, soul, and body, here it is, be preserved blameless unto da, 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 the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Brothers and sisters, I pray this finds you seeking and searching. This has been a, a, a bucketful of revelation of scriptures coming into understanding. And what a beautiful time for all this to happen. Right as we're coming down to the very end, right as they're about to pass a law or consider a law and get it into people's thoughts to ban Christians at a time when they want to put them in prison to a time when we know when the beginning comes, they will be getting put in prison for proclaiming to get ready at that time. Brothers and sisters, how awesome to begin to know perfectly. We don't have it all yet, but that is coming. The church of Smyrna, the seals, remnant bride workers with the Lord for 40 days and through seals, anointed by the Holy Ghost, watch and pray always, 14ers, because the time is near at hand. I love you. God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.